So in here, Dad's a picture of Grandma Rye and... Evidently a birthday or someplace. Yeah. Um, and then uh, another picture of my mother, and this is of her home in Hills, Minnesota. It would be in 1962 when we were back from California visiting her. So Grandma moved from the farm... Uh, to Hills. To uh, Hills. Her, my father... Uh, passed away in 1944, and uh, she moved to town, and my brother Norris uh, took over the farm. Okay, at that point. So now it looks like we're going to switch to your father's side of the family. Uh, the Gulick uh, Nelson, uh, Gulick Rye, was born in Valders, Norway, and he's shown here with his family, his father... And there is my dad there. So this is your dad. Yeah, he looks uh, looks like Sam. He does look like Sam, and, uh, uh, my brother's uh, son. But this is your, that's your... That's my father. That's your father. Yeah. And so this is with his family. And in Norway would be, well, somewhere... Uh, he left for the United States in 1888, so it would be somewhere when, back when he was looking about 12 or 15 years old. Mm-hmm. And did you have, uh, uh, so your father's name was Gulick. Was Gulick. Okay. Yeah. And I think Gulick was there. Okay. That's Gulick? Yeah. And uh, the only other one uh, could be this was Peter, perhaps. There's only two of them came to America in 1903. And you don't know his father's name or uh, this this one here or this one could be the families of the uh, Paulsons. So oh, the Paulsons. So, oh, okay. And so I don't know what their names would be. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, then this photo, Dad, is of your father? Right. And his brother, Peter. And he came to this... Well, is, it looks like just... Uh, is this your dad? Yes. Okay, I didn't... And he came uh, uh, to the United States in 1903 at the age of uh, 16. And here he's in his buggy... And I thought, well, maybe he could go be going courting there because it was pretty nice. Yeah, he looks nice dressed up horses. or going to church, maybe. Yeah. So, right. would this be in the hills then, do you think, Yeah, Dad? it'd be in the hills, Minnesota area. Oh, okay. So then, here's another photo uh, of your dad's... Uh, and, uh, uh, by the way, he came... Uh, I had a diary of his, uh, and... Uh, the first diary was in Norwegian, and three years after, two years after he got to America, he was writing his diary in English. Mm -hmm. He went, to the, worked on a farm, and maybe went a month a year to school uh, to school uh, during the winter when they couldn't work them all day long, and uh, and. Uh, uh, so he, he became proficient in English and didn't have a brogue at all. Hmm. His brother had a brogue, uh, so Peter. you knew he was from the old country. Yeah. So and then this photo, Dad, is... He must have gone back to Norway, and uh, I don't know his other brothers, but one was evidently in the Norwegian... Uh, He's in a uniform, like the military. Military. Which one is your dad? And uh, like the one with the white hat. And the white hat. Oh, so that's Gulick. Gulick. Gulick Rye. Okay. Uh, it pronounced Ria then. In Norway, in, in Norway, Norway it would uh, pronounce Ria. Ria. Okay. So then this is your. Uh, looks like. Is in, that in nineteen sixteen Gulick. Uh, uh, I married my mother, Emma, Emma Thompson, in 1916. So, nice wedding photo. And then, looks like this might have been an anniversary then. Uh, this for was in uh, 1940, 
4042, their 25th wedding anniversary in Hills, Minnesota. Who's, would that be on, so this is Gullick and Emma, but would that be on the family farm yeah, then the, in the, Hills? the farm in Hills. Right? So what we think of as, well, Grandma's the, farm, the uh, right where, farm yeah. where Donnie and Viv lived. Right. So, and it was their 25th anniversary? Right. Wow, okay. I didn't, I was thinking your dad might have passed He passed earlier, in 1944. And that was in... Hills. Right, but this photo from their 25th anniversary was probably from about when, Dad? About four, four or five years before his death. Okay, so 1940 41. maybe, uh, 40, 41? I, I can't see this. Uh, I don't think it had it on, Yeah. but you're guessing around 19. Right. Oh, that's... So then here's... Is uh, this your brothers a, and sisters? Right. Uh, my father and let's see, uh, my father. So that's Gullick. Gullick, and then my sister. With that, is that Grandma Rye? Grandma Rye to the right, and then in the middle there is my sister Opal. Oh, Opal in the middle, and then yeah. Norris. Norris. Aldora. Glenn. My sister. Beverly. Beverly, and my brother. Raymond. Oh, okay. Okay. When do you think that would have been, Dad? In oh, 19... it was in Valley Springs. Uh, I think it was Valley Springs in 19, about 1931, maybe. 19... No, I, I'm older than that. I'm yeah. So I don't know exactly what that... I may be wrong on the years there, because... I'm about eight years old, I think. Okay. Here's a fun photo, Dad. It looks like uh, maybe... It's uh, my brother Norris and my dad. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I think even in the rivers in Minnesota and South Dakota there, would be fish that big I don't, unless they went to one of the nearby lakes. Looks like a northern pike. Yeah. Um, uh, so, and that's Norris with that's your dad. Norris, yeah. Here's another picture of you with your uh, siblings. And uh, this would probably be uh, okay. It was about the same time as the other one. I'm a little older. My sister Opal. And my brother Norris, sister Eldora, and there's Glenn, and <laughs> Beverly, and Raymond, pretty close to the other one. Probably maybe the same time. Yeah. On that one, it's it's interesting that like uh, this almost looks like uh, more Eldora, but that's Opal at the time. This is Opal. Yeah. Uh, and this one, another photo, I think, of you and your siblings, Dad. Uh, different time frame. Sadly, poor, it looks like poor little Opal's Opal. crying. Uh, yeah. Probably. Uh, uh, but I'll have to go down to find out who's in their arms. There's Norris, Eldora, Glenn. So that could probably be better. That's Glenn. So there's prob probably my... Sister Beverly is, Beverly her is the child. Yeah, mm -hmm. just it. I it's just sort of sad in that it looks like Opal was crying at the time, yeah. it, probably crying because she's having to take care of the kids. Yeah. Is, um, but there is uh, uh, myself and uh, <laughs> Beverly. And Beverly, right. you're dressed up sort of fancy on that. Uh, yeah. This is what my son Randy says that he, my father was a farmer most of the time, but he said he never dressed like a farmer, but he did uh, have a, a car dealership and we'll, that'll come up at another time. Okay, yeah. so this is another uh, family photo, Dad. That, right. uh, and that is. Uh, uh, 
That's Beverly. That's Beverly. And Vivian. <laughs> And my brother Raymond. Okay, so it's the younger ones. Right. It's funny. So Bev's very serious, and Vivian sort of pouty and sad, mm -hmm. and then Raymond has a smile. That oh, again, oh, sort oh. of a fancy photo. Oh, it was taken in the studio. In the studio, oh. yeah. This is a in cute. This is a cute one where you guys are playing. Right. Uh, ride the horse. Who's who's at the bottom? Well, I'm at? at the bottom. So you and. And then uh, Norris behind me, and then uh, it must be uh, Beverly, and then Eldora. It's Eldora. So Bev, and then Nori. Yeah, and this would be probably on the Emo Fight Farm, west of Hills. Were you had you had a family get together at the I don't know. farm, or just Somebody you sort of rec Cameron. you recognize the farm? Yeah. So, another. Uh, family photo. So your dad Gullick and yeah. mom and, Emma. Right. And then Opal. It's Opal here. Norris, or, myself, and uh, Eldora. And this must be in Valley Springs because that was about the eight there. It was in Valley Springs where I was born. So in, and your mom's holding a baby too. So, so that would be uh, probably Beverly. 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 Yeah, because you can, you can just barely see the, the right. face She's of the baby, but so up to Beverly the would be. Mm -hmm. So, um, here you, I don't know if this would be at the reservoir? No, this is at the Laverne, Minnesota Park. They had the, uh, the Rock River dammed off, and that was a swimming pool, and from left, uh, from right to left, the Norris. Opal that, must be me you and, and Eldora. Eldora. So was it like a pond or a swimming pool? Well, was they it, just dammed the lake up and so you, there was a little little lake there uh -huh. and a, a, a swimming pool. Quite a treat to swim, I would imagine. Yeah, or, right, it was. So another nice, this again is a very nice photo of the family. Um, right, and this was pretty early on. Uh, I'm in my father's lap, so I look So you look like you're old. two or three years old, and right. you were born in? Valley Springs, South Dakota in 1927. 27, February. so so maybe this was 1929 or 30. Right. Uh, so your dad, Gullick, and Emma, right. but then so, would this be Op Opal, Dad? It would be Opal, Beverly, uh, Vivian, Eldora, Eldora. Eldora, and Nori. Norris. Okay. And there, my dad has a bow tie on. I never noticed that before. But well, uh, like Randy said, he dressed yeah. very nicely. At this point in time, were you living in Val? The family lived in Valley Springs. Right. Would and that be when he was? Uh, he had the Chevrolet dealership? He had a or? Chevrolet dealership from 1927 to 1931, and I think it must have probably gone under, but I didn't know anything about that until in the early uh, 50s, the late 40s, I was running hay balers in Minnesota, and I came to the Opine Farm, and they showed me a flatbed truck, and they said, we bought this from your father. And they had a 30 Chevrolet sedan. They said, we bought this from your father. And then I started putting them together. And, and then I remember we moved to a little rental farm house near Hills, Minnesota. And in the corn crib, there were three cars that were new. And he used to sit in them and play. I don't, <laughs> I don't think my dad knew, but they were playing in them. But, and I don't know what happened to him, but he must have sold them off. Yeah. Well, you're, it seemed like your dad always liked cars. Didn't he go on the train to yeah. buy cars? Right. I don't want to go and out that, of order, but didn't he used to... Uh, right. Uh, the, uh, some relation of one of my brother-in-laws, Helgeson, uh, and other farmers were uh, cattle uh, growers and they shipped them to Chicago and they could ride free in the uh, 
caboose and my dad would go along with them in the caboose uh, free, I suppose, and then get to Chicago, he'd pick up a car and bring it back. And later we'll have a, a, a relationship to what the cars had to do with our, our family farm. So again, another family photo. This one... It's a later day later one. Day. It could be in the... Uh, I was probably a freshman in high school. It probably could be about 1941. And going from the right there is Opal, Eldora, myself, Grandma Rye, my dad, and Norris, and Raymond, and Beverly, and Vivian. So there's Viv, okay. Right. Yeah, because uh, yeah, you're all dressed up, so you think maybe around 41 or... 41. 42, so... I would say... Would Nori still be in high school? Well, no, he would have been he, out He had then. to quit school. He quit school in eighth grade because my father was ill, and he ran the family and took care of the whole family. In the farm. In the farm. He got the checkbook from my dad when he was in eighth grade and had to take care of the family. So. And, and there's the last family photo, maybe, uh, uh, I would say 42 or 43 in the studio film. Uh, my, from the right there, my brother Norris, Opal. So you're over here. Norris. So Nori. Uh, Opal, Opal. Uh, uh, in the That's... top row, myself, Eldora, my mother, my, fa my father, Gluck, uh, Raymond, Vivian, Beverly, and my mother, Emma. That's a nice photo it is. And of, of all of you. Uh, but then, and at that point, your dad would have been ill, I would Im imagine. Uh, I mean, he, he was been, always ill. He was he, always he, ill. Yeah. And it was a heart issue? Uh, he had, he passed away of congestive heart failure. But he... So here's a get together. Now we've got some of the uh, brother-in-laws. Or... Some of your cousins, cousins too. Cousins, yeah. The, uh, probably, if I could hold that sure. there, here. This is at Elmer's, uh, Opal's farm, and uh, Elmer is probably holding Carol and uh, his daughter Carol, who just this last week had a knee replacement. Then was my brother Orville Bach, my brother Norris, and Lorraine, uh, Norris's wife's brother Lyle, and there's myself, so this must have been in 1962, the first time we were back from California. Or maybe, no, it wouldn't be, because there's Dwayne. So I... Uh, were you married to Mom, do you think, at that point? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, so we maybe looked in Worthington or something. And there's Dwayne and Roger and Barbara Bach. Barbara Bach, okay. So... I, I can't remember. Uh, I could have been teaching at Hills at that time. No. Yeah, because Duane looked like about a seventh grader and he was in my class. So again, it looks like the family. Um... Yeah. And uh, right, uh, going from the right there is myself, and the little head peeking over there is. Uh, Ingeborg Rye, and she came from Norway after World War II and stayed with my mother in Hills for a while, and then she became a housekeeper for a well-to-do family in Sioux Falls, and when it come time for her to retire, she took her Social Security and went back to Norway where she thought she would be better taken care of, and then she... Uh, I saw her in 1976 when I went to Norway. And then next uh, is my, my mother, my sister Eldora, brother-in-law Orville, Nori's wife Lorraine, 
Nori and Lyle, Lorraine's brother, and the little baby again must be Carol with her father Elmer, my sister Opal. God, that must be that must that must be Vivian. Yeah. And then Roger with his finger in his mouth, Barbara Bach and du Dwayne Nelson. Dwayne. Huh. Did it say nineteen forty three? No. It doesn't yeah. yeah. So at this point, uh we're start talking about some of the uh some of your brothers and sisters right. in, in order of birth. So the uh your sister Opal. She married Elmer Nelson and uh Opal. They uh the preacher came to her house and a little footstool they kneeled on and my mother was getting dinner ready and for after the wedding and uh she had got new shoes but she wasn't gonna use them in the kitchen. And so it come time for the wedding and she went in and realized she still had her old work shoes on. And so she felt badly about that. But here with Opal, we can have the story of the earlier family. Uh, my father and mother lived in Porter, near Porter, Minnesota, and uh, he was a skier and built snow, snow jumps and was jumping all through the uh, hills and valley and the neighbors thought that was crazy Norwegian there. Well, anyhow, he saw when he first came to this country, his name was Rhea, Rye, and some relatives said, you got to get an American name, so he changed it to Nelson, son of Nels. Well, then in Porter, he was on the farm, and he sold a load of hogs, and some other Nelson got the check, and he said, hey, this, uh, that's not good, and then my mother paid a loan off at the bank, and it paid off someone else's, another Nelson's uh, loan. So he got mad and went, had to go to court again to change his name. Well, in the meantime... Changed it back to Rye. Changed or... it back from uh, Nelson. Nelson to Rye. So uh, in the meantime, their first child, Norman, died in child uh, within six months. And then the second, uh, then m my sister Opal was born. So she was born in Nelson. And then there were twins born, Glenn and Garfield, and they uh, lived only six months. So anyhow, Opal here then uh, was born in N uh, Nelson. And then my dad changed the name to Rye and guess what she did when, what did she do? Well, then she married uh, Elmer Nelson. So she, she married became, Nelson again. Uh, so Nelson again, just okay. Just could be happy, you know. <laughs> so we we're talking about Opal and Elmer. Um, here's a photo of Opal and Elmer. Looks and like their 45th wedding anniversary. Okay. And then another nice photo of Opal and Elmer. And, uh, uh I can sort of wrap that tale around that, Opal and Elmer. Uh, early on, we said that uh, my uncle Nels had donated a 160-acre farm to the Tufholm. But Elmer, he's really a conservative Swede, and he really, uh, he bought, he and Opal and Elmer bought their farm from Gilbert Tuf who was a bachelor, and his sister was a spinster, and they ended up open, owning several farms. Well, when they uh, died in their will, they said, if the people of Hills will be build a home for the elderly there, within a year they'll get all the money and it'll take care of the home. And they built, well, I don't know, maybe 50 unit one, really nice, edifice. And so they built that and he said if 
If they don't get it built in a year, then the money goes to the Lutheran Church in Minneapolis. So they did get it done. Well, then in later years, Elmer was in the Tuff home after he needed some assistance in living. And so I would tell him, let me get this straight now. Okay, you bought Gilbert Hoof's farm, and you paid him off with hard-earned cash, and now here you're in his home, and now you're paying again. It do doesn't seem fair, and he, he would really like that. So then, years later after that, that's when Nels died and gave the other farm. Oh. So, so I would suppose, you know, 160 acres then was maybe you know, 160,000 or a couple mm -hmm. hundred thousand. Yeah. So, now this one is uh, uh, a nice photo of Opal, yeah. but with uh, Ann Beverly. Her sister, my sister Beverly and her husband Robert Nearson. Um, here's one of uh, your some of your siblings right. as well. So Uncle Tommy come back Uncle and Tommy is see how sharp he looks. He was that farmer in the old one. Yes, that he's come he's a long way. California. He's come a long way, baby. And anyhow, with him is my sister Opal, my sister Beverly, Uncle Tommy, Norris, and Eldora. And I think what happened. He, his wife's name was Lillian, and uh, she thought that the sun rose and s set on Californians. And she thought, you know, anyone who wasn't California, well, you know, anyhow. So they came back for their 25th anniversary, and these sisters and brothers had an anniversary for them and had the Legion Hall and all the relatives there. and. All of a sudden, these farm folks seem to be pretty nice people to Tommy's wife. And uh, uh, so it was really nice. And uh, actually, it could go there. Uncle Nels was he buried in the Valley Spring Cemetery. So then Tommy died of cancer. And uh, I became the administrator of the state. Well, she finally sent the ashes to me. I gave them to Eldora and uh, Opal, and uh, so they just buried them on top of his ashes, on top of Tommy's grave, uh, Nelson's grave. Oh. And uh, then uh, Lillian, his wife, died, and I got the ashes, and I sent them there, and. Dwayne's wife, Marilyn, was going to read this poem, uh, uh, Crossing the Bar, and she was, uh, in, wasn't was available, and Eldora read it, uh, I, I hope to meet my master face to face when I've crossed the bar. So she was buried on top of, on, on the ashes in Uncle Nelson's grave, too, and she probably would never forgive us for having read up in South Dakota, you know. <laughs> uh, another picture of Opal and Elmer. Uh, right, and, I, and that looked in later years. Mm -hmm. I don't know where it was. Some get-together. Here's one that's uh, 1959. And this was uh, Duane's, uh, Duane's confirmation, confirmation class and confirmed into the Lutheran Church. And uh, Dwayne then, uh, uh, when he graduated from high school, uh, well, actually, he was in seventh grade when I taught in my hometown, and he was one of my seventh grade English students. And uh, after uh, he graduated from high school, everyone was going to college, and he didn't really want to go to college, but... I guess that was it, if you weren't anyone, if you didn't go to college. So he went to college, and he set a record in track that st stood at the Worthington Junior 
college until his uh, sister's son uh, 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 Carol's son. Oh, uh, his, oh, Scott's <laughs> son. Uh, yeah, well, his grandson uh, Scott. So, someone in his family broke the record. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, and he came. He didn't want to go to college, but he went to college six, uh, one semester. Then he came to California, and I got him a job with our builder. And so he stayed there, and he was smoking at the time, and Randy and Dan and Angela were worried about him getting cancer, and they were sort of leaning on him to start smoking. So New Year's Day, he stopped smoking, and he lasted for 20 days, and then after that, after the kids had gone to bed, he'd go out and have a cigarette, you know, and he felt guilty because he was betrayed. Oh. So, and then that was the first chance uh, we had a relative here, and then people started coming to visit us. Uh, uh, Opal and Elmer came out, and we were in Long Beach and looking for a place to eat, and we came to a place, and it was called the Hills Cafe. When the hills is the name of the little 400 person town that we came from, and they, hey, I thought that was something. And then I took him, Beanie is a farmer, I took him to the dairy farm, the Dutch uh, from Steam moved to California, a good dairy farm. And then uh, uh, we looked over there and this Mount. Uh, 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 Baldy, or no, what, what's, you mean California? In California. Oh, what's, um, uh, I'll admit, Shasta, or it, it, no. It rhymes uh, with Shiska, and he proved it to the, the manure pile. He said, this is Mount Shiska, and this is Mount, it, it turned out to sell L.A., so they never huh. got over there. Oh, huh. <laughs> huh. so another nice photo of, uh, Opal, right? Just probably on the farm. Uh, on, uh, yeah. On, right. I would guess. Well, no, actually, it looks like they're home in Hills once they could be maybe moved into Hills. This is a fun photo, then, Dad. Again, on Opal and Elmer's farm. Uh, talking about Opal and Elmer. Right, and uh, after five years in California, we're able to go back home in 1962. And Dwayne and Roger, uh, this is Roger and on the right Dan and on the left Randy. And he took some big wheels and made a little chariot and they had big horses and it was really wonderful uh, to go back. And the kids were all horse people and uh, we did, uh, Donna, my wife, she wasn't a farm person, but they had horses for all of us, and we rode down, uh, uh, their farm was on the baseline where they correct the curvature of the earth, so when you went from their farm down to Iowa, you had to go over a fourth of a mile to this, that's where they, they changed the curvature of the earth, the, the baseline. Well, so there was a the little two L shapes you had to go on and we rode there and Donna had a saddle on her horse and we went down into Iowa and then we turned to go back and Donna's horse wanted to get back first and she took off and Donna hadn't ridden very much at all. And uh, Dwayne raced after the horse and was able to tow it in before they come to this double L shape to get into Minnesota and get to their farm. Or to grab so, the reins and slow it down. Yeah, he, and, and then that her horse, when he heard the other one coming, went, tread, went faster. Oh, yeah, even faster. Yeah. Oh, gosh. So, and, 
Uh, when well, Duane and Rog were both really good horse yeah, and, and I think Carol it was too. Roger that got her. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Oh goodness. So that was pretty treacherous. It could have been. Uh, yeah. Uh, bad. Yeah, Elmer's farm was right at the border with Iowa. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so here's here's a great photo of Opal and Elmer's family. Uh, where the kids are grown. I uh, So do you think this would be 1962? This probably? would be the same way where Uncle Nels was Elmer's farm. There was someone's a birthday or so, but uh, Dwayne, the oldest, is at the right there, and then Uncle Elmer, Opal, Carol, who just had their knee replaced, and Roger, who became a veterinarian. And... Uh, has been on Dan's boat, uh, uh, Good Ship Summer, uh, uh, Good Ship Sunshine for three, four times in the last couple of years. And he's ridden motorcycles all over the United States. He's a Harley guy, but he doesn't belong to the Hells Angels. <laughs> so, and then, uh... Uh, uh, that was the last of the photos on Opal and Elmer. Do any other Probably, stories yeah. that you remember of, uh, uh, or want to recount on Opal and Elmer before well, we start on Nori? Well, just one more thing then. After uh, Dwayne came out to our place, then one year Roger came out, and I think we got him a job, and he stayed in California for a little while, and uh, that's when our little dog, Peaches, had her second batch of puppies. The first time was 11, and then she had 11 puppies the second time. <laughs> and the kids were playing with them with Roger, and the kids wanted to keep them all. That was when we were in Gramercy Place. Oh, okay. So yeah. we have some good movies of that. Yeah, yeah. So, well, we talked about Opal and Elmer. Right. Uh, now, uh, so the oldest son in the family was Norris. Right. And the, here's a nice photo of Norris and Lorraine. Right. Lorraine Terrio was from Irene, South Dakota, and she worked for the Bell Telephone Company in Sioux Falls, and she continued to work, I think, until maybe 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, Norris... Uh, uh, when he was in eighth grade, I suppose, uh, just a, a 39 or 40, and uh, my dad uh, handed him over the checkbook and said, you've got to take care of the farm. So he, did, he quit school, and there were uh, seven children in all, including Norris. And I know Opal, I always saw her in bib overhauls uh, working, uh, and my mother helped. And I know we had about nine cows, and I, my mother and I milked them before I went to high school. And she could milk five to my four, so I never got, I decided I couldn't go into the dairy business, and a woman can beat me out, you know. But anyhow, Norris then uh, took care of the farm and all of the business until my father passed away in 1944. And at the, when your dad turned it over to Nori as the oldest son, it was just he couldn't physically he could, couldn't yeah. physically do any of the no. labor. Or, right. uh, and in fact. Somehow or other, he had an insurance policy, a disability policy, that paid $25 a month. So he also uh, could not, uh, he, the, the drugstore owner in Hills was appointed to watch him, we found out after he passed away. And uh, if he was caught driving, then uh, he would uh, lose his uh, pension. So at the age of 11, I got to be the chauffeur for my father, but we'll talk about that later. So the druggist was sort of working to well, keep track. It, 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 well, just if the there was activity, of, had paid him or paid whatever. Him to take yeah. Care of him. yeah, so it's pretty amazing that he would have had a disability insurance back then. Uh, I, uh, I, yeah, uh, that uh, is. Surprising. Yeah. Uh, 
But here's a nice photo of Uncle Nori's family. So Nori and Lorraine, but then... Uh, uh, and they had the most uh, beautiful family. Uh, the I think... Uh, the, well, you've got... Gary. Gary. Gary is the oldest. And uh, he became... Uh, when we went back in 1962, he had a house in Sioux Falls, but his dad liked to keep them close to home. But uh, uh, he, when we were back in 1962, he was mowing Aunt Sophie's lawn. Mm -hmm. And I told him, you know, to go wherever you the job is, you know, and do what you want to do. Or, and so he did become a drywaller and he went, went to uh, Gillette. Gillette, Wyoming, where all the coal mining is and uh, has his own business and probably sort of starting semi-retired now. And, and he has uh, a son and granddaughter that, that live on their uh, acreage outside of uh, Gillette. And, uh, it's a hilly thing, about 60 acres, and there's one little cottonwood tree down in a little draw. And uh, a, a, a type of hawk that is on the, the support Endangered species. Endangered species, let's put a nest in that deal. So here, on, on their property then, uh, company had the mineral rights of putting a methane well there and uh, it got pretty close to that bird and uh, Gary's wife I've never, Darva. Darva, I've never heard a hash, harsh word from her and anyhow they went to the parties that be and they made them move the well to the other end of the property for the methane, so it didn't disturb the the hawk. And so she said, this is the harshest word I've heard her say, she said, we finally got to kick butt. <laughs> 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 and uh, so it's just a great family. And Dale uh, is a, uh, he, he just semi-retired now, but he had to, uh, he served some tough duty in Vietnam, and uh, uh, I think he has a jar full of medals that he's not showed anyone. And uh, uh, he's uh, married uh, to uh, Jill, and uh, she now just got her doctorate in uh, occupational nurse nursing. And uh, all of the family is really uh, talented. And uh, David became uh, an Air Force, a military officer, and he served in uh, such high tech thing that he couldn't talk to anyone. And his wife also, and uh, now they live in Virginia, and. Uh, uh, he, uh, I guess his wife now is in charge of distributing war material, old war material to other nations around the world. And, uh... Does he have Brian? Brian, he, uh, is in Sioux Falls and he is the, in charge of the, all the public works auto vehicles. And uh, his daughter is an artist, and you know, most art people don't, don't get a job. But she's moved to Boston and she has, she watched, helped both grandmas bake and bake, and she baked cakes. And now she has a cake shop there that is, uh, has really tall orders, in fact. Uh, Dan and Bridget and their daughter Summer uh, last year, I believe, 
uh, went to Boston to look at Brown College, and here uh, their cousin Brian's uh, daughter had been commissioned to b build a cake for their 250th anniversary, and the cake weighed 600 pounds, and it looked like the front facade of the university and all the bricks were there, you know, and uh, Dan's uh, Bridget and Summer stopped at their shop, but she was out delivering things, but it's sort of a small world. And, and then Diane. Diane, uh, she uh, was one of the first ones to get uh, some, uh, uh, it was a, a hospital program like an anesthesiologist or some helper mm. and so she was had that uh, degree and worked in nursing for a while but she's been uh, now I think she helps out at a school and just a great family with her Bob and Helen Helen then is a the scrub nurse at, mm. yeah she's a scrub nurse at uh, used to be Sioux Valley Hospital and um, she's a great horse person also, and so I think uh, she's been on the good ship Sunshine. Mm -hmm. And, and Laurie, Laurie, Laurie. Uh, uh, she became a computer t technician, and uh, when she married uh, uh, Tom, Tommy, no, Tony, Tony. Uh, Nielsen, uh, he came to uh, Colorado where we were living and he took flight school and paid his own way. So they came there, newly married, and we had a motel and made a wedding suite for them and they stayed there for a week and then lived in Colorado for a week. So we got to be close to the, them and uh, they are uh, just... Tony's a pilot now for a, a, a feeder airline out of Minneapolis. And in fact, uh, their son, uh, Josh, and daughter, uh, Jasmine, Jasmine, were on the Good Ship Sunshine this summer. I had thought for a long time it would be a nice thing to have Dad, uh, you know, since he's got such a great memory to recount uh, the family history uh, of uh, his parents and grandparents and also uh, his brothers and sisters. And uh, I thought it would be uh, a, a treasure to have for all of the families. So here with uh, Glenn and uh, uh, Dad, you want to start out with, uh, we've got, we, we've tried to organize the family photos uh, so that... Um, um, okay, could we start with the Thompson family? Then? Yeah, let's do that. And the, uh, the, well, I'll hold it up here, so, uh, uh, coming from the uh, right to the left, we have uh, Aunt Mary and uh, her great-grandson uh, Keith Anderson we're still in touch with. The second one was Tullif and the third uh, was Nettie Bly and Uncle Albert and this is uh, my mother Emma Thompson and in the front was Tommy Thompson, and uh, well, we didn't know him, I didn't know him then, and in the later years, he lived in California, and he was our favorite uncle, or the only uncle there, and uh, he sang with the uh, San Bernardino uh, Barbershop Quartet, 30 people, and up to 300, and uh, we would go to San Bernardino and see their concert, and after the concert, he would have, uh, what did they call it again, a, 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 a really reef hab deal, and he'd have a group of four singing to our children, who at that time were uh, 
Dan, Randy, and Angela. They had a great time. And uh, then Ollie Thompson was my grandfather, but he died the year that I was born. And my grandma, uh, Lena Thompson, uh, she made the best cookies in the world, and we still have the recipe in the family. For Kringle? Yeah, or? the ch chocolate ones. Uh, oh. Uh, the uh, sort of cinnamon or something. Oh. Really, ginger. Oh, ginger yeah, cookies. Yeah, and they're oh. really great. And she was born in the Dakota Territory down by uh, uh, Vermilion, South Dakota. And she's about eight years old, I guess. And her, her, uh, her mother was had passed away, and she was taking care of all the children. And the neighbors, uh, some uh, were wiped out by some unfriendly Indians. And uh, then I think she died at 95. But somewhere along the line, they thought she had passed away, and she was in the. Uh, Morgue. A morgue, which probably was the back of a furniture store or something. That's what they used to do in those days. And uh, someone was going through and she moved. And uh, so she went on to live another maybe 60 years. They realized she wasn't dead when she moved. Huh? <laughs> that it was the back of the furniture store because that was that's the cabinet a, that's maker. That's the ones I know. Yeah. yeah. Probably yeah. so, yeah. Huh. And I don't know where that was at, but then... Uh, so that's Grandma Thompson here? Right. And okay. she died in Hills, Minnesota, and is buried there. And then to her uh, left there is uh, Uncle Nels. This and, one? Oh, no, on the front row. Nels. Oh, okay. And Nels was, uh, uh, he was a bachelor, and uh, everyone loved him. He was the opposite of Tom. Tommy, Uncle Tommy, he was withdrawn and quiet, and uh, when he passed away, uh, his friend Orly Nelson received a cash uh, amount, of which I don't know the amount, and it doesn't make any difference, but that was his best friend, and they were neighbors, and uh, he left to the Tuff home uh, his farm, 160 acres, and he donated to a home, uh, a tooth home, and we'll talk more about the tooth home when we come to my brother and sister Elmer, El Elmer Nelson, my brother-in-law, and Opal, his wife. Mm -hmm. And so that's the Thompson family, and I believe uh, their their parents, uh, my grandma's parents were, and probably my grandfather's parents were born in Norway and I don't know where but so they would be the first generation Norwegians in uh, the right near Valley Springs South Dakota they lived in Minnesota a half a mile from the South Dakota border and three miles from the Iowa border can you point out the people again just that because I wasn't really following okay you. so okay going from left uh, from the Right there to the left, uh, Aunt Mary, and uh, I think uh, had uh, really uh, so many tragedies in her life. Uh, her her son Merritt was the uh, father of our friend, the grandfather of our friend. Uh, Keith Anderson. Keith Anderson. Okay, so and, that's uh, Keith uh, uh, married Anderson. His uh, he married uh, Elsie Swanson, and uh, they uh, he had a brother named Lofton, and I was up to their house, and I saw Lofton, and he was going to Augustana College, and. He, this was his fiance there, and I wasn't very old, but I was old enough to know that she was a beautiful lady. And then he passed away, and then I had a brother named Otis, 
and we were at a picnic in Sioux Falls, South Dakota McKinnon Park in 1941 and uh, a big Norwegian dinner in the park and uh, he said, he was 18, he said, I got to eat a lot, this is my last meal because tomorrow I'm having my tonsils out. The next day he did have his tonsils out and he was hemophilic and he died at the age of 18. And then... On the operating... I, I guess yeah. so, in the hospital in Sioux mm -hmm. Falls. So that's Mary's, Mary's son? Or, uh, that, uh, Mary's son, yes. Merritt's brother? Merritt's brother. Okay. For, there so was lost was and Mary's, he went first. Mary's children. And then, and then he went. Okay. Uh, he was the youngest. Uh, and then it was during the war, and a couple years later, the FBI came out and looked for uh, Otis because he hadn't registered for the draft, and they didn't they, know that they he didn't had, know he, he had, had passed away. He had passed away, huh. and then uh, Merritt, the oldest, the father of uh, our fr friend Keith and uh, Anita and uh, Ken. Uh, Ken. Ken and Ken, who lives in Colorado, and uh, they, uh, I was teaching in Wellington, Minnesota, and I think he had been a farm agent, but he was uh, teaching uh, teaching in, in, uh, in South Dakota, and he passed away at about 45. And I remember going over to Worthington and seeing to this funeral in the uh, Swedish Valley, Beaver Valley Church, and uh, seeing the three little children there at the funeral left without a father. But uh, the uh, Elsie was a registered nurse, and she did a great job putting them all through college, and. Uh, fine and upstanding and lovable people who are still our friends and mm -hmm. relations. So and then that was Mary. Yeah. And then uh, Uncle Tulloff, he, uh, uh, and I didn't get to know much of him. I, we knew his uh, daughter, uh, she came when we lived in Riverside. She was the lady that came and visited us in uh, in uh, Riverside in Garbersey Place, and had a daughter about ten years old. And then we had the little ranch, horses and stuff. Uh -huh. And she left her old dirty tennis shoes there, and they they wrote a letter saying, "Hey, you know, we got a there's tennis shoes, so we." Packed up, Donna packed up the old dirty snake, snaking shoes and sent them <laughs> off. And then uh, Nettie, uh, Nettie, she married Swen Bly, and uh, down the line, well, they had uh, several children, but down the line, uh, the oldest girl was Lorraine, and she had a daughter named Cheryl, and Cheryl, uh, uh, was on the Iowa girls basketball championship team and uh, we touch base in Colorado and they had the motel with me and uh, then uh, Dan was in the airport in Denver making a call and uh, her husband went by and said hi and I said hi and that was about it because they were both tied up and then uh, just this last year so maybe six months ago, I found out that Cheryl was in, uh, had a 623 number and they called and she lived in Sun City Grand and her and Tom and Dan and I had uh, lunch together at the Greek Festival. Right. And, uh, yeah, so it's Cheryl, uh, so uh, Nettie's... Her granddaughter. Granddaughter is uh, Cheryl... Uh, Cheryl married, Hill. Right. Hill, married mm -hmm. to Tom. Okay. And then the other one is Uncle Tom uh, uh, Albert, and he lived up somewhere northwest of Sioux Falls, and all I remember, he was a farmer, but he had a well. Yeah. As I was saying, uh, Albert had a 
well on his farm northwest of Sioux Falls that had salt water. And those, their children were all older, but uh, very beautiful girls, and they were all friends of my sister Opal, I remember. Uh -huh. And then here is my mother, Emma Thompson, and uh, she was uh, evidently the baby of the family. And uh, we'll hear more of her as mm -hmm. we go along. Uncle Tommy was uh, a farmer, and then he uh, moved to California, and we were so grateful. Thought we had a he he was new, met some of the actresses, but he was a waiter in a restaurant, and that's where he saw them. But it's, it's made us think, wow, we're really made me think we're really with right. him now. And he early on uh, uh, was very musical and played a trombone, and he played uh, pickup with Lawrence Welk uh, before Lawrence Welk went big time. And then later on in life, he uh, uh, was with the San Bernardino uh, Barbershop Quartet. I think there's about 250 voices, but afterwards uh, he'd have what he'd get four fellows together and it was an afterglow that's what it mm -hmm. was and the four of them would sing for Dan and Randy and Angela and that was getting sort Very of special, special. attention yeah. you right. know right. and he was always at our place for Thanksgiving or Christmas and then my uh, my grandfather, Ole uh, uh, Thompson, he passed away in 1927, the day of my birth, the date of my birth, the year of my birth. And then my grandma, Lena Thompson, she made the best uh, ginger cookies, and we always liked to go there. And she lived with her son, Nels, and she had a... Uh, a dumb waiter in the house where they'd put the food and go down into the basement where it'd keep cool and we really were interested in seeing that work. And she was born in the uh, South Dakota Territory near Vermilion, and I believe that her uh, mother must have passed away uh, well, she was eight years old and she was taking care of the family. And some of the neighbors were massacred by the Indians. And later on, at some point, she passed away, but it wasn't really passing away. She was in the mortuary in the back of a furniture store or wherever, and someone walked by her and she moved. So she lived then to be 95 and is buried at Hills, Minnesota. And then, uh, last of all, it was uh, Nils, and I think he must have been uh, had polio. He had a, a limp, and he was a farmer and a bachelor, and he sang in the <coughs> in the Norwegian choir, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> he had a chance to go to sing in Norway. And he decided, oh, no, I don't think I could do it. And I think we were home in Minnesota in 1962, and he had a ruptured spleen, and he passed away. And it was so sad that he did that, uh, so that they called it a Sanger Fest, in which he sang. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, when he passed away, his best friend was uh, Orly Nelson, and he left some uh, a sizable sum of money to him, and the rest uh, was given to an old folks' home in Hills, Minnesota, the Tuff Home, uh, which we'll hear later about uh, more about later when uh, we talk about my sister Opal. So that's the Thompson roots. So continuing on with the Thompson family, just another photo of them, my Dad, if you want to identify. Right. Uh, this is later, uh, and here is my mother, so she looks like he's maybe in her that? 30s or so. And uh, there, 
uh, Uncle Tommy then was a farmer for a little while, but then his barn burnt down and uh, they used to, if they put hay in green, that sometimes the could uh, combustible make a fire. And so there's nothing new on the, it's just a later day photo. But who are the other people? Are they the same? Oh, here's folks? Grandma, now gray haired. And there's. Uh, so that's Grandma Thompson? Grandma Thompson, uh, Al Al Albert, Nettie, Mar Mary, Mary Thompson. Nettie, uh, Tullif, my mother, Nils, and there weren't many planes flying by then, but he was looking up in the sky. And, <laughs> and Tommy. Uncle Tommy, yeah. Again, so I recognize Tommy. Right. And that's Grandma, Grandma Thompson. Thompson. And this is Nettie. Okay, Nettie. And, Nettie, Nettie Bly, Bly is what she. And, uh, and Nils. And they had a 34 Ford, and it looked like they're almost stuck in the mud. And they were probably down in uh, Radcliffe, Iowa, visiting Mary. Okay. And then this photo is of Uncle Tommy and Grandma Thompson? Right, and it's at... Your uh, Grandma Thompson. Yeah, and it uh, looks like it's at... Uh, Nettie Bly's home in Hills, Minnesota. Okay. And the next photo, Dad, is right. sort of an interesting one. Uh, Mary Thompson married uh, uh, Mr. Anderson, and their uh, son, Laughlin, was engaged to a lady named Erickson in Sioux Falls, and she had a brother who was a small person, and he used to come out to the Anderson farm. And uh, he later was in The Wizard of Oz in 1941. And here he's standing by Grandma Thompson's little big cat, <laughs> and uh, Uncle Tommy, uh, well, uh, Otis Anderson, I was up to their farm, maybe five, six years old, and uh, he showed me a suit, you know, and he said, how... Oh. Uncle Tommy did? No, uh, Otis. Oh. Uh, Otis Anderson showed me a suit, and it was just a little kid suit. And he said, and I said, how old? He said, how old do you think this guy that wore the suit? And I said, you know, five, and... And he said, 21, so it was a picture, it was a suit of uh, K.O. Erickson. And then... K.O.? K.O. is what he was called. K.O. Erickson. And uh, then we lived about 15 miles from Sioux Falls, and we went to Sioux Falls once, and I must have been six or seven years old, and he was selling papers on the corner, August, August, get your August leader, and I went up and said, hi, and he says, you know, keep moving, kid, because I still thought he was a kid, and it was probably a bit annoying to have another uh, farm kid like me come up to him and be seen with me in public. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, Dad, yeah. then the next photo that we have is of your mom, uh, Grandma Rye, Emma, and... Is that one of her brothers then? That is Nels. Oh, so that's Nels. And this Nels. was in 1962. That's Elmer Nelson's farm, his barn. And we were back from California in 1962. And we had uh, a meeting of all of the families. And uh, the, he would, Nels would be the only one from the original Thompson family that was there, but all of our my brothers and sisters were there. So just picking up on the family history, uh, I think we're now up to uh, Glenn's dad's family. Um, so, Dad, do you want to talk about you growing up? And Okay. <laughs> I, so I'm still growing up. So uh, <laughs> I, I was born the 9th of February, 1927, in Valley Springs, South Dakota. And... Uh, I guess this is one of the first 
pictures of myself, maybe uh, two or three years old. Or, mm-hmm. Looks like it. And uh, I didn't know much uh, until quite a few years later, but I, my father had a Chevrolet dealership in Valley Springs. And uh, I think probably must have gone under in 1931 or moved. And I didn't find out about that until I, I was bailing hay in Minnesota and come up on a cousin who had bought a four-door Chevrolet 30, 30 from him in a Chevrolet truck. Oh. So always the last to go. <laughs> and... Uh, here is a picture of my uh, sister Beverly and myself sometime later. Uh, <clears throat> we lived uh, right near the Ford garage and uh, a block from the high school that uh, Uncle Elmer, uh, brother in law Elmer, attended school in Valley oh, Springs. In Valley Springs. And across and that's the South Dakota or Minnesota? South Dakota. South Dakota. Yeah. Okay. Three miles from Minnesota. And uh, across the street was a girl named uh, Doris Jacobson, and I think I must have been about five. Her her dad owned a Ford garage. I didn't know that at the time, but I had a dime, and right down the street was a railroad going to Sioux Falls, so we were took off and we got to a little railroad bridge. And you and the little girl? Yeah. What was her name again? Doris Jacobson. You and Doris were running away to Sioux Falls? or We had a dime to spend. <laughs> so, yeah. so we How had, far did you get? Uh, maybe two blocks from the house, but uh, a half a block from the highway going to Sioux uh, a railroad uh, bridge. What were you two going to do? Just spend the dime? F foolishly, yes. Spend it <laughs> all at one place, yeah. <laughs> and then sometime later, this was probably taken as a carnival. And uh, the uh, or in the meantime here, then we... Uh, moved to Hills, Minnesota, and then I should have figured it out, but there were three new cars in the garage, and we used to sneak in there and sit in them, and I guess then my dad sold them off later. And there, uh, we, we just had the buildings on the farm, that was all, and one day uh, a big rooster attacked it, my sister Beverly, and so we had chicken for dinner that night, because hmm. we don't like that. And then uh, I somehow tamed a calf and was riding around in the calf, and my older brothers and sisters were coming home from the school, and a friend was with them, and uh, he twisted the calf's tail and it bucked me off, and I broke my arm, and. They were pretty upset because they planned to go to a fair that night and they couldn't go. Oh. And then it gives new meaning to the uh, that Christmas story where the they always tell the little kid you'll shoot your eyes out with a BB, the BB gun. gun. Yeah. And we had it. There was a BB gun, and I had it uh, illegally, I guess. And my older brother Norris was trying to take it away and. I shot him, but I missed his eye and <laughs> hit him somewhere near the temple. So uh, they, uh, uh, it's a good thing that I wasn't doing that in the present day. I'd be, I'd be long gone. Yeah. And uh, so. Uh, Some of the other stories when you were a kid, I mean, you had to take care of your dad. You've always talked about that. Well. I was too young there, and my sister coming up that was the one who uh, who uh, who took care of him. He had uh, he had he had a uh, maybe twenty five dollar a month disability, and uh, here's when I was about confirmation age, about 
uh, 13 or 14, and at 11, uh, my dad wasn't supposed to drive, so at 11 years old, I got to drive him all around the country, maybe 30, 40 miles, but that was quite a lot, the country. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, he, he wasn't, I think the drugist, druggist in the neighbor town was supposed to be watching him because then they could disallow his uh, disability. Disability, and uh, I know he used to. Uh, some cousin said that he he had a truck, and he used to go up to Porter, up by Madison, where uh, Susan lived, and uh, get flour from the mill, and then distribute it to the neighbors, or probably sell some, get some for the neighbors also. So I. Uh, that was one of his ways to make a little extra money. I think so. In addition to the disability, yeah. Take care of our own family, and uh, so but, I did go to kindergarten in uh, Hills, Minnesota, and then uh, I wasn't to the sixth her her ninetieth birthday party, but she remembered me. I had. Uh, the one with ants in my pants or St. Vitus dance. Now, whose birthday was that? Dad? That was the 90th birthday of our kindergarten teacher. Oh, And I don't oh, know where okay. I was at that time, but uh, so she was pretty young then. And uh, so I did, I rejoined the class in about sixth grade and I was in the top 10 of the class there were 11 people <laughs> in class, and uh, so, but that's another story a little later. And uh, th then we uh, moved out to uh, uh, back on a farm uh, west of Hills, and uh, my, we went to a country school, and it was on a little hill and I don't know what grade it was in, but my friend and I threw some rocks at the screen windows, and he had to run over the hill, and I had to run downhill, so I got to go back and spend time after school. So, you know, just... You got caught. Just got caught. And uh, uh, I just met this friend. I saw him two summers ago in St. Paul, uh, Elert Peterson, and uh, he remembered that we had a hill near our place, and the class, the school, the eighth grade would go skiing and toboggan on that hill, and then we'd go to our house where my mother had tomato soup, oh. and he brought that up and remembered that. And uh, so... Uh, I was thinking of uh, that you had to drive your dad around because you were too young to work. Well, I much was on the, the least farm. valuable on the farm, uh -huh. and uh, and I, I drove him around. I think once he did drive, and he turned too soon and drove in the ditch, they got him out pretty quickly. So, and I, I, my one son is now a acupuncture guy and a chiropractor. But way back in those days, I guess they called them muscle bone crushers. And I think I drove maybe 40 miles to a town called Canastota, and there was a family that was doing that. And my heart, father had heart trouble, but uh, we went there, and uh, I got to go in the room with them. And I know that they stopped pretty quickly because I guess he turned purple. They they moved his back and he turned purple. And yeah, uh, so I didn't get to uh, go back there. He never went back there. Go ahead. Uh, well, so... Um, 
anyway, we were talking about you growing up on the farm. Right. Um, uh, uh, but so at that point, when you were bringing the mail up from the mail uh, box, uh, you know, with using the horse, was were you on Grandma's farm then? Or yes. Was, okay, yes. that was on Grandma's farm. Right. And then when did you move on to Grandma's farm then? Uh, 19th, March 1st, 1939. Okay. And March 1st was sort of the official farm moving day. Right, That's interesting. because it's in be a couple months before planning and yeah. good things. And, and these 12 horses all had great big harnesses. I know I used to, uh, the horses were tame and we used, I used to crawl between their legs and, you know, just a lot of silly things. And then on December 7th, 1941, uh, we had 80 acres on the other side of the Illinois Central Railroad tracks, and I was out there hunting rabbits. You hunted, uh, I really uh, hunted because during World, a little later during World War II, uh, a jackrabbit you get 25 cents for, and a skunk you could get... Uh, five dollars for the hide and for fox maybe about 15. That's so we money. were sort of hunters and yeah uh, that'll take me to the one uh, my dad uh, had congestive heart failure and he went to the hospital so much uh, you know he just said well he just going and he's coming back you know and uh, so uh, but uh, I better get back to that 1941 because my future brother-in-law, Orville Bach, drove up in his 32, 34 uh, Ford Coupe and uh, our driveway was less than a block long but he could get it up to 65 miles an hour before we got down to the road mm -hmm. and then he'd slam on the brakes so we'd slide out into the highway. But he came up and he said, well, I'm joining the Army, and uh, and he did, and uh, we told about him and his sister, and anyhow, uh, the, uh, the uh, later then, it was in December of uh, 1944, that, that my father went to the hospital, and I, we, I didn't know it was the last time, but I was out trapping skunks, and I had two of them, and that was maybe $50 worth of money, and, and I was riding back in the horse, and the skunks were hitting against the horse and me, and they were taking him out on the stretcher. Well, I waited, but they wouldn't let me in the house. So then, because she smelled like skunk, probably, yeah. and and my mother had to bury them, and I had me bury them in dirt in about a week, and they didn't smell anymore. But my dad was going out, and I got to say hi, and I didn't, you know, he always went to the hospital. You, know, you so didn't know just that that was the time. time where he wasn't coming right. back. Yeah. So then I, uh, I was a junior in high school. So then the next year, I finished high school, and 18 days after I graduated, I was in the Army, and six months later, I got Christmas uh, furlough, and so then they had a picture with my, at Christmas time, with my brother Norris, And then, and then a Christmas present with my mother, Grandma Ryan. Emma Thompson. So and this would have been 1944, Dad? That was in 1945, Christmas 1945. And the war hadn't ended yet in 45. It was oh, in the spring? It, it, or it ended in the... In Europe. Uh, well, this was... Uh, it, it had ended in Europe. Okay. But uh, the war didn't legally end until uh, January, uh, November 30th, 1946. So we did forget to 
think. I guess maybe this is my college picture. Yeah, I think that one yeah. might be college. But anyhow, That's a, I probably, the GI Cockies uh, probably didn't uh, do up too well, but that was in, I was in a prison camp. I was a guard, and there were 35,000 in the United States American prisoners, guys who screwed up and got locked up. And we had 35,000 there. Uh, we had 3,500 there by Santa Cruz, California, and it was on the ocean. And you take you had either had a sawed-off shotgun or a submachine gun, and you'd go out and have the prisoners work. And they had double-edged axes, so you didn't want to work to make irritate them. You know, make them work too hard. And we'd go out in the eucalyptus group and uh, grove, and then I'd say, okay. And the guards weren't supposed to sit down. They'd throw you in the guardhouse for that. So we'd come to the grove, and I said, okay, you guys sit over there, and I'll sit over here. And when you hear a jeep, we all stand up, and we work, you know. So nobody took an axe to me. But on the way back to the guardhouse, they'd say, oh, we've got to use this latrine, and uh, I had four prisoners and a submachine gun, and we were in this little toilet, and you couldn't see it was just dark, but they had been making liquor, and they hid it in the, in the big tank, the big tank, you know, uh -huh. what do you call it? Oh, uh, I don't really. Where the water. Cistern type yeah. of thing. Yeah. They had, okay. Yeah. So that was their chance to get their liquor for... Right. And be, before I was there, when I was first in the Army, there were 15 million Americans in the Army, and God, they sent me to finance school in Fort Benjamin Harrison, Indiana, and in finance school, and we were to try to get out uh, as many people before Christmas as possible. And I was at Fort MacArthur in San Pedro, California. And the guys that were in supply, they had to, t people had to turn their stuff in. And greed sort of come in there because some of these guys had nice flight jackets and, and, and the guys in supply would make them turn them in and then they'd take them for myself, themselves. And the, the Pacific Electric uh, train, uh, little trains that were in vogue in California, and we'd ride at night into on Liberty, and uh, I was so green. There was a guy with a Italian patch, and I told my friend, boy, he must have seen a lot of combat. Look at all those patches, and I said. You dummy, he's an Italian prisoner of war. And he, <laughs> oh, yeah. was, he was going yeah. on leave, yeah. you know. Yeah. Like, what yeah. is this, you know? So uh, that's... Uh, By that time, it didn't matter, I suppose. No, it didn't yeah. matter. Well, you talked about uh, the... I don't know if they were prisoners or the fellows that were like the Chicago or the policemen that were so tough. No, uh, no. Or, they... One guy killed his first sergeant. Okay. One guy, a young guy, killed five Japanese, but the war was over. Oh. And so, and anything, any, just a roll of things, you know. Okay. And I thought you said at some point there were some pretty tough, like, policemen or something around, well, or maybe I've forgotten that. Uh, yeah, well, there, the, uh, we we took well, they burnt down the camp and uh, in California in in Santa up by Santa Cruz and we took and I, we had some prisoners out the day before and they said they'd give anything to be in solitary confinement so my friend and I went to town and they burnt the camp down and all night the other guys were marching them to another facility so we got on that but. We took 250 to uh, Missoula, Montana, where they had an empty can, camp. 
and we took seven to f to uh, Leavenworth. Leavenworth. Lifers. Yeah. Well, we were talking about your dad and you driving him around. It seems like you would drive him to a place where he could get a a decent meal or something and oh, you'd sit no. outside. Or? Home, we went to the courthouse in uh, uh, Sioux Falls. Uh, oh, uh, he would eat out, and because they could do a, electric stoves, and he couldn't eat fried meat, oh. and uh, so, and that was a little different. I remember uh, I would sit there; he'd always eat alone yeah. because it, uh, we could always eat at home, you know. Right. But that was uh, something else. What about when you were a little boy and you got run over by the Model A? How did that happen? Uh, was it was, that, you it were was, pretty young, weren't you? Yeah, I, I, we were, I was still in the... I was under five or six. And uh, we had a locker where you kept the meat in town. And my older brother, Norris, was uh, older and he got first choice and on the way to town he took the front seat and I had to sit in the back and so I really wanted to go into that locker because it was cold you know but I wanted the front seat <laughs> so I sat in the car and uh, then uh, when he came out then we left for home and uh, uh, my dad always was looking over the fields and we went over the Vidoc Hills and I was leaning against the door and it wasn't latched and it pushed it open and I grabbed around the window frame but my feet couldn't quite reach the, the great big running board yeah. and my brother Norris saw me and he froze up and I couldn't hold any longer and I dropped and I got run over my legs and I could see the people from the dentist's office down the street about a block by where Maryland is. Oh yeah. And uh, the, got run over and I guess uh, I must have, I didn't break anything but they took and uh, the, again I fell on a bad day because they were going to go to a band concert. <laughs> to another. You screwed up a lot of fun I things. I screwed up a lot of fun things. And, uh, so then we moved to a farm that uh, was a full farm again. Was that Grandma Rice Farm? Then, no, that yeah. was a farm uh, uh, west of Hills. Okay. Uh, four miles west or two miles north. And the um, Evil Fike Farm it was called now. But I think it was a farm that was in my mother, in the Thompson family. Oh, okay. Well, there, uh, my uh, my father would uh, take a train with uh, some cattle feeders from Hills and get ride free in the caboose to Chicago, and then he'd buy a car and take it back and sell it because there was a freight difference, and. Uh, so my mother and my brother and my older sister had to milk the cows and the calves were right near the back of the cows and they, someone had a pail full of milk and they set it by the calf bin and the calf was drinking and someone, probably my brother, threw a stool at the calf and they killed the calf. Um. So they had to hurry up and butcher it so my dad would find out when he got home. Yeah. And on that farm, too, I guess I still had a liking for guns and I had a, a pump rifle, it must have been. And I was out shooting pigeons by the barn, and my older sister come and took it away from me. And I ejected the cell shells and went in the house. She said, You sure it's all empty? I said, oh, Yes, of course. And she, she pulled the trigger, and there was one left of it. And, she thought she heard my little sister fall out of the bed upstairs. Oh, for so sakes. And I don't know if they were stricter on me after that or that. <laughs> and so I went to country school and uh, Opal and Norris and Eldora would ride with a neighbor in a 30, 34 Ford. 
and my school was on their way, and then they, they would give me a ride, so I took to, in the wintertime, having my sled and grab onto the black bumper. They would or they wouldn't? Well, you, they didn't you, love to ride in the car. So you just uh, held onto the bumper on the sled yeah. going into town? And then, uh, and there was no town, just a little up in the next quarter section. And then they were trying to get rid of me, but <laughs> so but I held on. But my little bucket that I had my lunch in, the cap came off, and my lunch was full of rocks. Uh -oh. so there, that was uh, the sort of thing. And then my older brother and uh, and the other neighbor had gone to the country school, Norris, and the neighbor Melvin Nelson. And the neighbor's son was a great big guy for for his age, and uh, they liked to tease him, and they made him walk in the ditch on the way home from school, and uh, so, and then they were teasing him so much that uh, his dad came down and grabbed. He was a great big guy, and grabbed both of them, and someone sinked the dog on him, so. Uh, Walter Anderson and uh, uh, so told him to lay off his son, mm -hmm. and so then they went to high school, and I had to walk in the ditch <laughs> for the next year or two. So but that was a nice place. farm, and then uh, probably about 1938, 39, my dad and mom bought another farm and. March 1st was Mar was a uh, moving day during the uh, for farmers and the hay racks and everything was loaded up and you went about five miles to the new farm. But when we were there, we did had uh, they had to didn't have enough grass and they had a, another t t farm. Uh, there was a farm for rent just grassland about uh, seven miles away and so we uh, they got horses and took the cattle all along the road and someone would have to ride ahead and cover the ditch the next driveway so the people would go in the cattle would cattle go would in go there. That farm, yeah. and uh, so and that felt like quite a long march because I think I didn't have a horse. Now was that when you was that when they moved to Grandma Rice Farm? No, no, that was Rice farm? that was when we were still on the other farm. Oh, okay. And had uh, yeah. so we had a lot of uh, things uh, when we then in 1939 we moved to another farm, and there we still had uh, twelve workhorses and. Uh, we would ride the horses on Sunday, and we would get them all excited so they'd run, and you'd put some oats in their little box, and then let them have two bites, and then you walk off. So you ride off, and you can hardly get them to go because they're thinking about that oats. But on the way home, we could really fa go fast, uh, really rapid. Because they wanted to get home to yeah, their and, and, and their they box. gallop right into the stall. So uh -huh. you had to put your head down. <laughs> and uh, as you went through the barn. Yeah. The uh, and we'd ride every every Sunday and and once my older brother Norris and his friend Quentin Larson, who was who I mentioned in that uh, honor flight. Oh right, uh, right. Uh, and one of his sons wrote a letter, I told him, right. uh, Quentin Larson. And uh, so we, uh, his younger brother and I, took the best horses and got about two miles away, and we were hiding in the grove like they do in the movies. But they saw us and took the horses away, and we had to walk home. <laughs> And our mailbox was a quarter of a mile away, so I put a horse collar on the horse with a rope, uh, a sling rope, two two ropes going back, 
and wind right up with a big old coat and put the mail in my pockets and then get on the horse with the mail and then throw a snowball at the horse and he'd take off for home. Because mm -hmm. he had had oats in his box, too. Oh, okay. I could get all the way except uh, around the corner. And then once, he really wanted to go when I was behind. And then he passed a car. And we, uh, but there was another car coming. Oh. And, and we made it back. And he, he knew enough to get back in the wrong way. Huh. Mm. We were... At the doorway of Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary, and that's as far as I had to go. The, there were seven lifers, and when, uh, when we went through Salt Lake City, they kicked out all the windows in the, in the passenger train by their seats. You can't handcuff them to anything, that's against some rule, but uh, the prisoners who were handcuffed but not to anything, and they gave them a pants where it's too big in case they run, they had to hold up their pants, and they were barefooted. And I, I forgot to say on the trip of the 250, that's quite a big trailload of uh, people with guard, two guards for every prisoner. And the guards inside could have just have billy clubs. And uh, in the vestibule, when the train stopped whenever, wherever, and from San Francisco up through the mountains to uh, Missoula, Montana, is pretty a long ride. A long ride, and uh, there was a a boxer during World War II who was wounded in the South Pacific, and they gave him so much heroin in that he became an addict, and that was the biggest drug scare at that time, which probably wouldn't even be noticed now. But uh, they gave us amphetamines or something. Speed to keep you away to keep the away. guards. Because when the train would stop, you'd have to go down, stand by the side of the train with your submachine gun in case anyone jumped out the window. And so I, I took the chance of falling asleep and falling out and threw them out of way because that's how much it scared me. The drug, yeah. So then, uh, in, uh, on, in uh, I was discharged then from uh, in Northern California, Fort Ord, and I hitchhiked down to, uh, to to L.A. to see my uncle Tommy, who lived there. And going through one town, it was on a Sunday. It was it was, it was a Mexican town, and uh, we had to go to the bathroom. And the guy I was hitchhiking with, he was just a little tiny guy. I don't know how I got in the army, and we walked in to use the bathroom. And when we were leaving, someone gave him a great big shout, and we just fortunately was in the right way, and we kept going. And then I think well, they, your money uh, mustering out pay was about $450, and there was no checking account of this, so you were carrying it, and you had a patch that said a ruptured duct that showed that you were discharged. So. The rupture duck was just taking your eagle and turning it upside down? I, I don't know, or, I think, but it was just, that's what they called it. It looked like maybe it was an eagle, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, But everyone knew you were discharged well, and you probably no, had cash on you. We hand. tore ours all off. Oh, okay. Because, At that time, because you didn't some guys be... picked me up and said, oh, I could just get out of it. No, i just go within the army. And then I got down to... Again, the worry being getting robbed, you know, there you were, you had just gotten your discharge money. Yeah. So, my uncle wasn't home, and I, I got a bed in the YMCA, and so I wrapped the money in my pocketbook up two or three times in my t-shirt here, and I'm not, my eyesight isn't very good, but then somebody came in drunk, and they had the wrong bed, 
and so I had to unwrap my money three, four times during the night, so everybody should have known that I had some money there. And I went out to my uncle's, and I was smoking them. They weren't home, and I left a cigarette, and I went back the next day, and she said, there was someone here. There was a cigarette at our apartment, and I'm worried about it. And so I had to tell her oh. it was me, so she didn't worry. And then we went to the uh, area where we find the end of living, which said Riverside, San Bernardino, Norton Air Force Base, where uh, Mike's dad lived oh, in Redland, yeah. and he was, he was stationed there. Was so here we're discharged, but then we wore a ruptured deck so we could get a free plane ride. And we were sitting there, and a guy came through that was taking a bomber to somewhere in uh, Nebraska. But then we didn't get up and salute and, you know, hey, you know, we're not in the Army anymore. That kind of attitude. So he took a fight, fighter plane so we didn't have, could go along. So the next plane that came along was a big one and we could ride on that, but it was going to Texas. And when I got to Texas, I was further away from Minnesota than I was from California. As a discharge, you could just ride along, yeah. you know, for free. And then... Most you were on your own to make it home. Yeah, and they had a parachute, and, you know, I was one of the first ones in, and, boy, I put that parachute on, and I was sitting there, and guys come in with a parachute, and throw it way the hell the other end of the plane, and put it, <laughs> what the hell is this, you know? So I was quite... Uh, Greenhorn, yeah. So then I did uh, uh, had enough money to get to. Uh, uh, no, that was another trip. Okay, but uh, so anyhow, I hitchhiked across Texas. So I got home, and then I did. Uh, 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 there was a club called 5220. You got $20 a week for 52 weeks. And it was in Minnesota. And it was cold. And my cousin, Odin Bly, a sister to an uncle to uh, Cheryl. Oh, okay. Yeah. He had a 40 Dodge convertible. And he was going to California. And he tried to get my mother to go. My mother was widowed. Uh, by then for two years to go to see her brother in California but she uh, wouldn't go or take that jump you know, go away from home so I went along with them, with her and we sat in the back of a 40 Dodge uh, convertible and uh, when we went through Las Vegas, my mother saw the first big time gambling and get so did I and she said, I gotta go back to the hotel, I can't stand this. And anyhow, we got to uh, uh, California and then the three guys, we decided to look for work in Washington. So I abandoned my mother and then she had to take a bus back home. And after that, she took a bus everywhere, visiting all her friends and neighbors. She got comfortable with the idea yeah. of traveling. She did. And then, when the spring came, there used to be an inbred feeling that you had to work on the farm and stay on the farm. And my brother Norris, who was farming, uh, offered to take me in, and I thought that that was what uh, you were supposed to do to carry mm -hmm. on. And anyhow, so we started farming in March 1st, and that was my first GI loan. I got a loan to start farming. But fortunately, my brother and I didn't get along very well. And uh, come uh, September 1st, I, I didn't have a car, and I... So my college preparation that I planned for was one day I said, hey, you know, I, I'm not going to take this any longer. I can't stay here and be a failure of farming. So I hitchhiked to Sioux Falls and en enrolled in the Augustana College. So that was my 
counselor was uh, the school of hard knocks, <laughs> and I, I did graduate from there. And so, Dana, you and Nori, when you were farming, you were talking about, uh, or you had told the story about riding his motorcycle. Well, it was before we were farming. Uh, oh, okay. Maybe in 1942 or 43, when I was maybe a sophomore in high school, uh, my brother had bought an Indian 74 motorcycle, and uh, he was absent a lot, and I had a key made. And uh, I would take the motorcycle out in the field, and if I laid it down, I wasn't hardly strong enough to lift it up. And so uh, I, uh, I uh, would ride the motorcycle out in the field, and then pretty soon I was good enough to get it on the road. And, and uh, the... Uh, <clears throat> The uh, my uh, friend, his brother had a, a Indian too, and we would ride, and uh, sometimes we'd go through town and at, at ten or eleven, and we wouldn't do anything with the uh, trottle, you know. But still, motorcycles make a lot of noise. So the editor of the paper then wrote a story saying those people making so loud noises so. After that, when we went by his place, we turned him back and the truck back, took the spark back, and oh. he really knew we were there then. Oh. And uh, uh, the old highway used to have rain troughs over them, and I was going around the curve, and I hit one of those and bounced back on the road, and I thought I'd probably better not do that anymore. And just two summers ago, when we were back, my nephew, Brian Rye, brought a friend of his and a friend of my brother's who was on the motorcycle when they were going to the Corn Palace and somebody stopped in front of them and they flew over the car and that's when uh, they stopped riding the motorcycle. So here this 92-year-old guy, I had lunch with him, and he told me that, uh, you know, that Norris, my brother, had said, I got to get rid of that motorcycle before Gabe Gwen kills him. <laughs> <laughs> so he sort of knew yeah. all along. So in, I, I had thought of me, I liked veterinary medicine, but uh, I could cut the math and geometry and science. So I switched over to... Uh, uh, speech and drama and speech mainly and uh, a minor and history uh, major and so I did get a teaching degree in 1951 but when I was in college my team my cousin and I teamed up and bought a couple of John Deere hay balers and during the summer I would bale hay and so in 1951, when I graduated, there was still hay and flax store to mail, so I, I did have offers of jobs, but I couldn't, I got to pay for the machine, so I stayed in until October, so I didn't get a job teaching, and that's when I took the job as a youth director in the Como Park Lutheran Church in St. Paul. Oh, okay. That's how that happened. And uh, who was, you said you were partners with a cousin? Yeah, Odin Opine. Oh, I didn't know yeah. that. Okay, so you were... He's a, he was a cousin, a son of there, too. Oh, okay. Now, was that when uh, Uncle Jim worked for you, or that was later on? Yeah, that was, yeah, that was that. And but uh, were you dating Mom then, or...? Well, that, I'm coming to that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Then, so, we bailed. And then, uh, well, let's see. I, I guess, uh, yeah, I, I guess I, I, miss, I misspoke there. I didn't get a job, so that's when, uh, in 1951, the fall, there was no job. So then I took in the 
Lutheran Col National Lutheran Council hired me. Oh, no, that's the next year. That's next year. Yeah, so uh, 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 then in May and June of the next year, I uh, quit the youth director because I had to go back and take care of the Baylors. Mm -hmm. And so then uh, that I bailed her in the summer, and and then uh, I went as a graduate assistant. I was getting paid to. I we went to Estes Park for it was a conference, oh. and it was in Estes Park, and they hired me to go as a graduate assistant to Mother Tana State University. Okay, to, so to, that's and to hold in. Courage the Lutheran students to meet and attend church, and so the Chinook winds there, and I get it come from the winds, the Indians used to dry the meat in such a way, or hang it out that was sort of smelly, so you could smell that from the Indian camp, and that's how come they call them Chinook winds. Oh, okay. But my uh, sinuses and stuff couldn't stand that cold weather anymore, so I went to Arizona and started uh, 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 teach, substitute teaching and uh, working on my master's, and uh, that which I had started at uh, Montana. And so then I'd come back in the summer and maybe at least uh, maybe the second uh, summer I came back and I went to Sioux Falls and they had an arcoded ballroom. And uh, I met a friend who graduated from college and I never went, was with him at all. And anyhow, he, uh, I met him in the bar and he was going up to the dance and he had a new Buick convertible and we went up to the dance and that's, uh, where I met my wife, his mother, and uh, my wife-to-be, and we took them home. And that must have been, and then we went together a little that summer, and then I went back to Arizona again, where I taught at uh, Tucson Senior High School and Rossford Junior High School during those years. And would that have been like 1952, 53? Oh, well, maybe 53. 53, okay. 53, and I can't know exactly. So then the next year we came back, uh, we wrote and we did, dated. So uh, then to get through here was probably my graduation picture and my graduation. They did give me my degree when I walked across the stage because I hadn't paid to all the bills. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, during those summers, uh, my, uh, I, when I had these two hay baler goes, I, there, there was a little uh, lake in this property of 25 acres and uh, it used to put water to the Great Northern Railroad and had a stockyards and everything. So, uh, I, a couple years I bailed for my brothers and my brother in law, and they would buy up fence for me, and I would throw the bales on the baler and not charge them. Mm -hmm. So then they bought the fence and one day set it up all around that 25 acres right at the outskirts of town. So when uh, I, I got there, then I g got to hired uh, my Don as my wife's. Uh, this is going a little ahead. Her yeah, father yeah. Oh. Uh, was uh, suffering from cancer, so we moved back to be where him in his final days. And so, uh, young kids can't join the, I came down there with, uh, I, I had some sheep, 
and a horse, and uh, the the kids, farm city kids can't join the 4-H unless they have a project. So uh, I went to the bank one by one with about 12 kids, and each U cost four dollars, and the, the banker told them, "Well, oh, this is very serious. You're signing for this money." And I had to co-sign for every one of them. So I had 12 kids with uh, sheep down there, and the superintendent came late, two weeks late before school, after school started. And the first thing he did was come to me and see if his boys could have one there. <laughs> so I had the superintendent under my thumb from day one, you know. And uh, anyhow, that is a little disjointed. But, uh, uh, so you and mom dated, uh, we, we dated, and of course, in defense of mom, she says that dad should never have been at the dance because he didn't like to dance, but he was there at a dance. And yeah, and the other guy became a dentist, and he married the other girl, Donna's friend, and he went to Coos Bay. And they got divorced, and oh. we got divorced. Well, yeah, you got divorced a long yeah. time. Uh, so here, here's, here was uh, when we were dating, dating, courting, and I think that's in front of. Uh, uh, it's probably, uh, I, I don't know. It's probably in Sioux Falls by either Sophie's uh, Aunt or, Sophie's or her mother. Yeah. So. Uh, I, then I went back to Phoenix, Tucson, and I said, I better, the second summer I come home, I said, I better marry that girl because she won't be around, you know, very long. So then we did uh, get engaged that summer, and we're married that summer, and I'm in Wait, the... Would that be 1954 then? 1955. 55. So there's dad and mom's wedding. Yeah. And you got married in Hills, dad, or uh, Sioux Falls? Sioux Falls, and mother's Methodist, uh, not a Methodist, uh, Congregational Church. Church. Right uh, uh, near F Phillips Avenue. Yeah. Who was your uh, mom's uh, bridesmaid? Was her one friend? I, I don't. Uh, I, 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 I don't can't remember, remember her name. Who was your. Best man. My was, mine was, uh, I think. Uh, wasn't one of the brothers, or no, Elon Peterson, my oh, friend in okay. the Marine Corps. Oh, okay. So when you got married, well, uh, on the wedding day, there's a funny story at room. Well, we better hold okay. off a minute because I had to work. When we start going together, then her younger brother Jim, uh, I got him a job to drive the tractor with the baler on it, and the baler sits way out to the right of the tractor, and I just, being growing up in the farm, I just thought everyone knew how to drive a tractor, and he did know how to drive the tractor, but... Uh, he didn't know about the he, wide... The wide turn, the wide and turn. usually you turn inward, and then uh, he turned outward, and the baler went and tried to bail my brother-in-law's fence. And it sort of tore up the baler, so we had to drive to Sioux Falls and get the needles go up and tie, and it smashed them. And so uh, Jim said that he thought that was the fastest he had ridden with me, you know, because <laughs> the farmer, he wants that bailing done right now. So then... Uh, and Jim, at first, uh, when I'd take it up, he thought I was teasing him, but uh, I, I wasn't. And then later years, he uh, went to, on the golf course in Sioux Falls, and he saw my brother-in-law, and he said, do you remember me? And he said, no. He said, I'm the guy who bailed your fence post. <laughs> so he eventually uh, took it, well, anyhow. So... Uh, the uh, the uh, I then after we were married we we had a new a '54 Chevy pickup and uh, 
someone had built a plywood camper and we bought that for fifty dollars and put it on there and then we drove to, to Tucson and uh, we drove in in the Black Hills of South Dakota they used to have the Passion Play each year and uh, they had it there and we went to that and we went down so we went through Cheyenne we went through uh, uh, Fort Collins and then we went to Loveland Colorado little but known to us that someday we would live there and our kids would go to college there uh -huh. but uh, Fort Collins the wide streets impressed me and I remember oh. that and then we got down to uh, Colorado Springs and we went to the Garden of the Gods now my brother-in-law Elmer had uh, three, four sisters, and one sister was married to the jolliest of guys, and he had a laugh. You could hear it all the way around, but they were really uh, 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 very, very religious and very, uh, uh, very fine people. And here we're going to the Garden of the Gods, and here. Up the slope, I saw this. Uh, uh, I can't remember his name right now. But the relative who yeah. was sort of devout. And uh, his wife, and very prim, and they were up there, and, and Donna, the good looking girl, sitting on the passenger side. And I said, Hey, reach out to Wendy and say, Hi, Leonard. You know? <laughs> and she did. And he, <laughs> they, they looked at each other and he, they uh, really threw them off base. <laughs> and, uh, and then they come down and so, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> Almost had him trouble. And then he was a fine singer and he did sing at uh, our, my daughter's funeral. Mm. Very great. So, um, that was the funny story of what, after you and mom got married. But you were saying you went to Tucson. You were heading to Tucson at that point. But then did you end back up at Hills to teach uh, after well, that? Or how did that so work, Dad? I, I had a, a, a contract at Roscoe Junior High School in Tucson. And uh, so we got an apartment close there. And then uh, Donna, my wife, your mother had worked in the Red Owl stores, and she was so good with figures, and I think she was probably a cashier. And so uh, Tucson evidently then even was a little rough place, and the head cashier had a bulletproof island right in the middle of the store, and they sat in there, and then the other people would bring the money in, and the other clerks, you know. And so she, right away got a job there mm -hmm. and then we knew her, her her father became sick so then we didn't renew the contract and that is when we went back because of her father's okay death. so you moved from tucson back to uh hills hills and that's when i had the sheep farm and all the students that were in the program Okay. And that was a volunteer thing. And yeah, so that was back in Hills. Now, but tell the story of the day you got married, yeah. you had to make a choice between saving your... Because, uh, uh, and I forgot yeah, when you guys I, got I, married. I, I, I'll get it. Okay. Okay, so I, I had the, this acreage and then I was going back and had another boy, the Brown, Daryl Brown, uh, was with the other tractor driver and then I had two tractor drivers and I would throw bales on the deal and I stopped at a hatchery in Sioux Falls and they had 500 geese and they were going to drown them because they didn't want to feed them and no one had bought them so they gave them to me so I took them and turned them loose in the lake and uh, they, they weren't uh, they were mostly land ducks but they were always in the lake and the turtles in there would grab their leg 
and they, they, I'd be le one less, one less. Uh, they provided one, a lot of food for a lot of creatures, yeah. but still some of them survived. Yeah, and they all, they survived, and my young helper was going to then sell them for Thanksgiving. Well, the day that I got married, I was on the way to Sioux Falls, and here, uh, going down the ditch to who knows where, were my ducks, my geese. They had, and the I had got broken, or the gate was oh, left there was open, no, or... there was there, there it was a cattle guard that I built oh. with ties, and they the, the the cows can't get across, sheep can't get across, but the ducks and stuff can. And there they were heading down the highway, and I had to decide. Should I go through with the wedding, or should I chase my ducks back home? But fortunately, I went through with the wedding, and I have children like this. So, <laughs> uh, blessed beyond. Uh, I didn't some of them get to the elevator and well, were riding uh, the elevator, or that? Uh, right, right across the railroad track was an elevator, and if you've ever been to a grain elevator, they had those big cups taking the grain up into the deal, and my geese would peck it there, and fortunately, unfortunately, a lot of them went up in the elevator. And it's the big that, ladder thing that scoots the grain up into the top. And, and those big towers. And unfortunately then, too, my mother lived in the town, a little town of 400, so my ducks would, my geese would wander up Main Street. <laughs> I must have embarrassed her a lot of times. But fortunately, everyone must have had a good Thanksgiving because by Thanksgiving, all of the ducks <laughs> had the disappeared and there weren't any left to sell. So, anyhow, <laughs> so uh, that was before Chick a Filet. <laughs> <laughs> so, you were back in Hills then teaching. You, you told yeah. the story okay. about. The... I taught in my own hometown and. Uh, Ten years is all it was time elapsed since I had left. So most of my classmates lived in the surrounding area and uh, didn't miss a chance to tell my students what I had done when I was a student, you know. So it was a little touchy. In fact, uh, if you've ever been in a study hall, it's usually a place to warehouse kids who don't want to study. So one young man raised his hand and said, Mr. Rye, can we carve our names into the desk? And I said, you know, hey, what kind of question is that? And he says, well, your name is in the desk too. <laughs> carved and I said, desk. well, you would do what you want to do and I, what you can get away with and that's the way it'll be. And then uh, the state inspector was around and in the spring they had the windows open, and one kid threw the textbook out the window, and he hit the state inspector. <laughs> you know, it came from my room, and so they suspended the kid for a week, but his dad took him fishing for the whole week. So you know, crime does pay, <laughs> not quite as much. But anyhow, while I was there, well, you know, the coaches of the district get together, and so do the speech teachers. Uh, the people who do the play. So the coach at a bigger town said how great debate was. Uh, I didn't have, never participated myself, but I got the material and then the t four of the, uh, two, uh, two boys and two girls, four of the uh, brightest kids in my opinion. And in the, my government class, I had an extra room and said, hey, you go work on this. And you can just read your notes. You don't have to listen to my lectures to get out of that. So anyhow, the guy didn't have any competition in the... In was the, he in Worthington? He was the yeah, debate coach in Worthington? Right. Okay. And so then we started beating him. We started beating him. And so I don't forget, maybe 50 years later, at a reunion, one of the kids, he was a, pa a Dutch pastor's son, he became president of a, 
a church college in the Midwest, and he sought me out to thank me for starting the page. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so that was, that was rewarding. Well, so the guy didn't like the competition, <clears throat> so he hired me to be his assistant. So I went to the big town, maybe 15,000. Uh, the, the, the town that had the Turkey Day Parade every year, 500 turkeys went down the street, and it's the home of Swanson's, the first. A uh, TV dinner was made oh, there. Really? Yeah. Oh, really? So anyhow, the day that I came, he got a better job in the Twin Cities, so I was in charge of debate, drama, everything. And in those days, you get paid extra for each one, maybe a couple hundred dollars for debate, a couple hundred for the plays, and a couple hundred for this. And the superintendent calls me and, and that we can't pay you for those. You got to prove yourself. I said, hey, you know, I'm taking this job, but you always lose an argument. So I just loaded up more kids for speech, and uh, <clears throat> we won a lot of debates. And uh, they had a stretch car, a '54 Mercury, uh, like our big stretch cars now. And then I got twelve dollars extra for driving that two hundred miles up to the cities, to where we took the debates took place. But my wife's sister was a soldier's wife in Great Britain, and so I wrote to her, and she sent us Cockney records. So I, I say, if I were many more English, I could hardly talk, type of things, and. Got those records, and the two boys and the one girl, they, you know, just was a piece of cake. Would they learn the Cockney because they were putting on a box and cox? A, a one-act play. One act play, but a, which, a which? Gilbert, a Gilbert and Sullivan one-act oh, okay. play. And in the play, there's a landlady, and there's two, two, two guys at work, and one, different shifts, and she's running out the same room to each one. Mm -hmm. And they'd meet each other on the stairway when they're changing the shifts every eight hours or ten. And uh, so the, uh, the, the, the gist of it, uh, they uh, finally, they said, oh, they got introduced. And he said, oh, do you have a tattoo on your chest? He said, no. He said, my brother, <laughs> so, so they ended up being brothers. Uh, they also wrote the HMS Pinafore and uh, uh, well, that's a fun, and the yeah. P Pirates of Pizan. Uh Well, anyhow, uh, I had three one-act plays and uh, I hired a school board member's son who taught somewhere else to judge the place so he so I might get paid for doing mine and uh, these uh, kids I went to Augustana College in Sioux Falls and I was in one play and I had to be in one play to get a speech minor and in the Shakespearean play and uh, so these in Minnesota, there are 10,000 lakes, and I don't know how many schools there are, but these three students, we won the Minnesota one-act play contest in 1956. And kids being how they are, we, I was driving this stretch car up, and they are already won four, just four uh, events to get where they were going, or five events. So and they, they were, were sort of full of it, you know. And they they said, you know, I wonder why Mr. Rye is going along. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but anyhow, we went and won the one-act play contest. And probably in March, and those kids didn't do much more school because of the Chamber of Commerce, the Lions, the, every club in town, they went 
performed as oh the play they, oh. that the school thought I'd better stay where I was you know yeah in the class and that's as it right, was right so this one boy I I didn't give a maybe what do you call it tryouts. I was had a hundred students in this assembly, and he sat right by my desk, and he was one of the guys that was perfect. He didn't give me a problem, so I chose him. And as I got to know him, he had been in a country school, and he was so quiet that the school, the, his teacher of the country school, called him Mossy. And, you know, what a bad thing to do to a kid, you know. So here he just blossomed out. And my drama instructor in college was the one who did the first uh, judging of, of about 15 schools. So he met him then. But this boy went to my school, my college, and he was in every play. Yeah. And then he ended up teaching the sister of the guy you were to dinner with, Christy. Oh, yeah. He, uh, uh, Christy's mother. Oh. Uh, so, uh, Christy's, the sister, Keith's sister. Keith's sister, okay. The one that uh, married a Airline hel pilot. helicopter. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so it's such a thread. And, uh, and, and, then, uh, and then she had uh, been in the class that he taught. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. So it's just so funny how things yeah, work together. How the... So uh, then uh, uh, well, we were in Hills. Our first daughter, Angela, was born. And here is her, her mother and myself, her mother down and myself, and then my sister uh, Vivian and her husband Don Helgeson, they were the uh, godparents when she was baptized. And uh, then in Worthington, our son, Randy was born, and this is a picture of him being baptized, and Norris and Lorraine were the godparents. Oh, okay. So right. that's his, his brother Randy, or my son Randy, and he's in uh, Texas now, 32 years with Hilla Packard, and uh, uh, five years as a rancher, and raising goats, and longhorn, uh, no, uh, Black Angus, and he has two jobs, and uh, the neighbor thinks he's retired because he never leaves the house, and uh, he often gets called to headquarters in Palo Alto for conferences. So they uh, they tried offered to fire him five times, but he's never taken it. And, uh, I think they told him. He told me. They told him. Just don't let anyone screw up really badly. Hmm. And so uh, there, there was uh, uh, there was uh, a sort of a continuity there. And uh, we had been uh, still, uh, when I left Hills, my first job to go to Worthington, they had a sale and sold the tractors and balers and stuff. And then, so I still had a pickup. Well, Donna was Donna was uh, about six months pregnant with Daniel, so her doctor said that it couldn't drive to California to pick up. At that point in time, you had you decided to leave Worthington and go to California, or well, we see. In Worthington, you needed big money to buy a house. In Worthington, they didn't have any junior colleges, but they had junior colleges in California and really advanced ones. So I was thinking as a teacher, 
they could live at home and go to Riverside Junior College. Oh, okay. So that's why we could have gone. And it, I drove out to California during Easter vacation, and I was on the top of the world. Everyone thought I was great, even the superintendent. <laughs> so I had to, everything in my hands. You and got I, a job lined up for... No, I didn't have a job lined up. Oh, okay. But... But uh, I, I had everything in, go, in Worthington. In you Worthington. had everything. I got and, you. Uh, okay. But everything is temporary in teaching. And so another guy who was being fired, he went with me. And we drove to uh, California. And he was ready. To, he'd been fired. And he was really down. So somewhere Kermit? along the lane. He was offered a job, I was an offered job, but I didn't know who was next. So uh, I didn't take a job, he took a job, went back and finished out the year. I didn't have a job and we took off for California and uh, we lived in the motel and uh, then I finally went to a school in Riverside and uh, the guy said the music teacher from River, uh, Minnesota, where I taught, he had hired him, Otteson. Kermit, yeah, Otteson. And uh, I was walking off the parking lot after he took me to the car. He said, wait a minute, Mr. Rye. So here, a music teacher from Worthington ended up teaching there in Riverside, and we got a home, two-bedroom home, and they already had five kids. And uh, when we moved in to Riverside, but that's later on, but here, this, they had bought a house, and they moved in with us till their house was uh, closed. Mm -hmm. So that's such a small world. And then the people that lived upstairs was another teacher, and they, the Hawks, uh, Hawks, uh, the... Uh, Hawks? Hawks. And uh, that's another continuing story. And then they moved to California. I later sold them a house, and then later... We adopted a daughter, and they had three girls, and I said, how come they can get a boy, a girl? Why can't we get a girl, a boy? And then they adopted a boy, and all because of the daughter that we adopted. Oh, okay. So, the hoax. just things go like yeah. a tread through life. Yeah. So, uh, Dad, you were starting to tell the story of moving from Worthington to California, the doctor said, you can't, uh, mom was pregnant with me, right. you can't take her pregnant with these two little kids in a mm -hmm. truck, you need to get a car. So, that story, or? Oh, yeah. So then we bought a 52 Chrysler New Yorker that was uh, a county commissioner across the line. You know, some farmer had driven that, so we... I sold the pickup right right out because every year I would sell the pickup when we went to that we had bought when we went to uh, wherever I went and so uh, the uh, the the uh, the uh, we got everyone moving to California and. Uh, then we had to, uh, uh, we got the 52 Chrysler, and then with two children already, Donna needed some help, so a friend of my mother's, her name was Carolyn Leland, she had some relations there, and we would give her a free trip to California and pay her if she would come along. So we did uh, had a little trailer we bought and uh, had all my books and stuff and what little things that we thought was worthwhile taking along. 
And going through Utah, we saw a wheel pass us, and it happened to be a wheel from the trailer. That you were pulling, bouncing yeah. by you, yeah. yeah. And it chewed the treads off the wheel, and it was 10 miles out of town, and, and I remember then someone cut the threads and put the wheel back on, and we did make it to California. And uh, 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 the first house we moved into, uh, the uh, the uh, it was uh, uh, okay. It was yeah. It was where our friends the Aldersons moved in with us, and then. And I guess I got that wrong. We we moved into a house, a duplex, and our best friends, we met at church. Uh, uh, I had the first doctor my wife went to was a... Uh, osteopath? Not um, oh, osteopath. Wow. And all the doctors in Minnesota said, watch out for those osteopaths because they're not quite as high a level as that. So we went, uh, yeah, we, and, and it first went to an osteopath doctor and my wife, she got just all, all frantic actually, very dismayed. So then I went to a Lutheran church and I said, please send out some pregnant ladies. And they sent out several and the Craigs, so Betty Craig came out, and they saw us living out of boxes, and uh, the uh, 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 there's a little out there we had moved in to the second place, the county hospital, and we were going to walk right across the street and have this young man, and we didn't know it was a boy, and. Uh, that night, uh, one night, a uh, mental patient on the eighth floor got loose and sort of terrorized the hospital. So my wife said, I don't think so. So I went to the church then and asked for some pregnant ladies to come out. And they came out, and our best friend, uh, Betty Craig, was pregnant, and her husband worked for IBM. And then they saw... We were just living out of boxes, and uh, they sent out some friends. Betty Craig, oh um, Betty, and she came out, and Doctor Don, uh, Donna took her doctor, and uh, she had been exposed to German measles, and our Dan was born healthy. And their dad, their Owen, Owen, was born with a, a damaged effect, yeah. heart, and uh, we were friends until he passed away at the age of thirty-five. He got through college, and they were just the greatest uh, uh, friends. But uh, and uh, actually, the second house we moved into was close to the school I was living in. So here's Dan's mother. Dan is in the arms. And his sister and brother are there, and I'm there. And the little guy here, Randy, was a little old school teacher that rented it, and she, we saw the sign, and she happened to be walking by her rental and there was water running in the street, and Randy was stamping in the... And he looked at the little girl, he said, well, because of her, we'll take her. <laughs> but we don't know about this kid stamping water in the street. When when I was delivered, you were in the hospital, too. Yes. Uh, I took a job as soon as we got there, and first one was lo loading Hay, hay bales and in California the bales are big and I threw bales all day long but I didn't go back and I didn't go and collect a check because I didn't want them to know that I couldn't take it and uh, 
So then I got a job on a golf course, with building a golf course in Sunnymead. Mm -hmm. And some great big guy from Tennessee was working with him, and we were carrying a tree off to plant, and he stepped in the big hole where the tree was going to go, I guess, and I got all the rain of it and hurt my back and was in, uh, hospitalized. And then my mother's brother, Tommy, then, who was living in that town, she she wrote and to my mother and said, and my mother said, well, my son lives there now. So he came oh, that's and Tommy. visited us. That's how we got together there. With Tommy. In, with Tommy, who had lived in L.A. Oh, okay. So uh, we were blessed for the third time with our Daniel Jean. And... Uh, so mom was on one floor in maternity and you were on another floor in traction for your back. Yeah. So It was the second time I hurt my back. I tried, I had to hold of the baler and someone pulled the tractor ahead and they put me in the back seat of a car. I could only be on my hands and knees. Oh, and geez. So when I had gotten a new suit for college, but then I had a brace on and was in traction every night and I had to cut open the back of the pants so my deal walked across the stage and then I still didn't get my diploma because oh. I hadn't paid the bill. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so everything seems to have a thread and mm -hmm. keeps going, you know. And uh, so... Uh, we lived right by a railroad track, and Daniel grew to even, we'd stand out, he'd wave at the train even when you were just very small, and then later when we'd travel, we'd always wave at, you would always want to wave at the trains. So I taught at that uh, school, so this is backtracking a little to fill this in, and so, I forget where the general trend of what was. It was, it was. A, it's a start in our family, yeah. Right, right. Well, and you were teaching at that point, yeah. and teaching drama, or you had had a, you did some plays. I remember uh, it, it, in California. Yeah, every homeroom, every six weeks, they have to do a play, and I would uh, <clears throat> direct the plays for each room, each group. And uh, <clears throat> so when we were at home then, Angela and Dan, and Dan was probably the one who was led around, and Randy. Rand would make up plays. Oh. And give, they'd always be giving a play. And so, uh, we had a cousin who had nothing but tragedy in his family of losing both of his brothers and uh, uh, his fa losing his father at 45. And I, he uh, was a pharmacist and the girl came in for something for her eyes and he sort of liked her. so. He had to come back a couple times, and and they got married, and they were in California. And that's Keith and Lois, who I have Keith lunch and Lois, with their daughter. And he Chris was just today. with their daughter today, uh, and so they came to visit us, and they came, uh, and they felt that the world was so evil that they didn't know if they'd bring children into the world. So here, our kids were putting in plays, and we didn't put them up to it, but we did things on our own. So here, they led the kids in to the double bed, stack beds, uh, bedroom, and uh, the uh, my, my daughter, Angela, uh, she opened the service, a church service because they went every Sunday 
and then I think Randy was maybe the minister or something. And it then, was like a play, but... Yeah, and then Dan came in to serve communion, <laughs> and they decided then that they would probably have children, and they had three beautiful children. Yeah. So at uh, Rossbridge, uh, I, I was in the hospital, and I got out, the day that school started, and if you could walk into the classroom, then you were covered by Blue Cross. So uh, there were four different buildings. It was a big school, and I got by my door and stood against the door, not uh, against the side of the door, so nobody bumped into it. So I would make the first day, so I would be covered by insurance. You know. The year I was born with your back and yeah. such? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then when I was in traction, we had a big castor bean tree, and uh, the castor beans would drop to the ground, and you could hear it. And then in traction, you more or less lay awake anyhow all night. And the neighbor lady had come over and told my wife that she saw some window peekers. So here uh, one night I heard some strange things and the bedrooms came from each side out into the hall to the front and so uh, I thought I heard something and I got up with my back and humbled toward the front of the house and just the then my wife, Donna, came behind me and said, Are you okay? <laughs> so I didn't know she was there. And it was all for nothing because we bought a home and she then bought a home nearby and she was seeing window peekers there too. So we sort of dismissed her. Oh. But, uh, did that throw your back out again though? Or no? Oh, or just it didn't do it any no, good. It didn't do it any good. And no. uh, so. Was that when we moved to Jones? Well, or? yeah, that's I'm coming there now. So then my. Uh, we were paying $87 a month rent. And. Uh, one day we happened to go out to look for a home and the broker was on the track and the house was, I'm a veteran, and was $50 down and you get to live there three months free and then, so we already were ahead of the game and he'd give me a job. So we looked at it and we bought the home and we moved out there and put in the lawn, and uh, the, the development, we were on maybe a couple hundred, but there are only four homes left. And so here, uh, I took the real estate license, because in Worthington, I tried selling insurance, and during Christmas vacation, when I didn't have play practice and that, I was the uh, outstanding salesman for Minnesota, <laughs> Iowa, and South Dakota. Just and, working two weeks. And two weeks. So I tried to get back into that in California, but they didn't want me again. So I was in the real estate. And uh, so we put the grass in and put a, a woven wire fence up so the kids could roam. And... Uh, That was, this was about that time, yeah, this is about, this was about Jones, the time yeah. that our family was when we moved into the track home. Three, three bedrooms, a one and three quarter bath, and $85 a month. And so, uh, it was, uh, really wonderful and here we had a bath and three quarters and I didn't dare to tell all my farm relatives back home about the bath because most of them didn't have an indoor bath and we didn't have anything but we had three two baths you know so anyhow then uh, the broker had 
a subdivision in Anaheim. He had three big subdivisions, so on Sundays he would go down uh, to Anaheim and check maybe a couple hundred homes there. And he, had, he went to three other subdivisions that he was over, and then he came to me, and there's four homes left. And he came up to, by then he was pretty uh, dispirited. And he said, well, okay, Glenn. I said, well, I, I sold four homes. He said, this is no damn joke. This is, this is business. Don't be crapping around like me on that. What kind of a he guy are you? Said, hey, his leg. hey, I sold four homes. <laughs> so I got a plaque at Christmas time. No down, no jobs, and no no requirements, but he got sell them the home. Well, for veterans back then, yeah, yeah uh, you you know, and there was of course war, end of World War Two. So many. So guys. then we had the lawn in, and a guy come out from Ohio was the. Uh, he was uh, retiring, and I don't think his wife liked to leave in a while anyhow. But I showed him the track, and he said, I like the one with the lawn, I like yours. And so he, we put in $50 on the lawn, and then he, he, gave, he wanted the home two days, so he gave us 3000 down, and we moved out. In, 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 in two days and sold him my VA uh, loan. And uh, then his wife got homesick, so they walked away from the loan, and my house got repossessed, and then it come on the market as a repossession, and I sold it again. So... So, but uh, um, anyway, so that was the house on Jones then. Oh, uh, that was the house, the, the rental was on Jones. The house we put the, what was in, in, in Hedrick, 1010 Hedrick. Oh, Hedrick, up in, yeah. Up in, La, was, La Sierra, up okay. in uh, Arlington. Okay, because, so that was the first home you bought was right. Hedrick. Yeah, I was too young to remember Hedrick. So then after you sold Hedrick, we moved to Jones in uh, Riverside well, he, or La uh, Sierra? We, we rent, uh, I had the broker didn't make me pay a commission on my own home, so we had to rent a home from him, and we rented there until we bought a new one on 4029 Jones. Okay. And uh, on, on the VA again. And uh, uh, the, uh, I was... Then selling on Saturday and Sunday, and I was making more on Saturday than I was during the week teaching. But uh, I liked teaching, and uh, it was the first year I had to get rehired again. But I was rehired, and then rehired, and I had I think I had tenure. Uh, but then. Uh, I couldn't afford to teach anymore, so I took a two-year sabbatical leave. And uh, then, in the meantime, I'd gone and got my broker's license, and my friend and I, Jim Smith, we were always selling in uh, two or three tracks. And they finally got tired of the other broker I think he had a drinking problem or something, but they got out and announced, and uh, these guys were really strict. In fact, my partner was a uh, construction worker, a road construction worker, and he used to swear once in a while, and he quit doing that because the two builders didn't like that. So it was Jim Smith. It was Smith and Rye Realty, but then it was uh, Johnson Myerscoff were the builders, yes. and they were strict on... Yeah. <laughs> so, so I thought, well, I can always go back to teaching. So I took a two-year sabbatical, and one development we had in La Sierra, Sierra Hills, had about this would be nineteen seventy sixty-two, sixty, and 
some of the homes were 30, 35,000, and they were furnished just, you know. <clears throat> but the of University of Loma Linda had a campus five blocks away, so I, uh, I was a broker, and Smith and I were equal partners, and then I would go leave the five model homes and go down for an hour and take a class. So in the two or three years, then I got my master's degree in history and English from the University of Loma Linda. Uh, and I would have to lie a little if the builder came up and didn't see nobody at all his valuable property. I'd have to say I was out on the track, but he never uh -huh. did come down. He lived in Yucaipa. Yeah. Quite a way. So then uh, uh, we moved... Uh, uh, to uh, 4029 Jones, and they had a a swimming pool and a little park, and so that's where uh, we lived. And uh, uh, then I got to sell at some of the better tracks. Well, th that was before we went to our cell. I was on um, Gramercy. Yeah. When on Jones, then is where. Angela and Randy started grade school, and then I ended up in grade school as well there because right. it was right down the street uh, right. on Jones. And uh, uh, in fact, yeah, right on Jones, and this is a different t time and space, but uh, then uh, his brother, our last boy, Greg, was born, and he had some breathing problem, and he had to stay in the hospital an extra two weeks, and so somewhere we have a movie of the when he come home and the three kids running in the, the sea. Uh, was that Gramercy though, or was that, that was Jones? Still Jones? That was still Jones. Okay. But then we then we moved to Gramercy. Okay. And put the patio in the next year. Okay. All right. Yeah, I don't remember. So. When uh, in Jones we had Peaches, the first our yeah. first dog, and a lot of nice memories from right. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> and then they continued their plays with the uh, uh, Owen and the Craig children. That in fact, last two two times in the last two years, uh, three years ago. I and the Craigs were on Dan's motorized vessel, and we went on the west side of Victoria Island with them. Yeah, Vancouver Island, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And so another thing was right, still... Right, right. Still friends with the Craigs fam yeah, uh, Craig uh -huh. family. And uh, so uh, we lived there, and we had movies of them swimming and jumping off the swimming pool, diving board. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, uh, in the summer, one summer, then we went down to Palm Springs where the rates in the hotels are cheap and uh, uh, nice hotels. And there's Mount... Uh, uh, I don't know the name of that mountain right yeah, outside but of it's in the, Palm uh, Springs. San Jacinto, San Jacinto Mountains. Mm -hmm. And we went up there on the tram, and uh, the uh, kids all had a knife and were whittling, and the park ranger was telling them how to do it. And here, another generation later, my my son's children in uh, Colorado, uh, Colorado, my youngest son, his his kid uh, were in the park and there was a With kid with him and he said, "Get out of the danger zone there." So I think our parent uh, we might have not done so well, but anyhow, then we moved, and then when Donna was in the hospital with Greg, I drove by, by a home. And it backed up to seven acres of land. And I put a deposit on, and then we uh, uh, 
purchased that house and sold the other one and then had sheep and ducks and horses and a donkey and uh, had right behind our house. And uh, Dan, we had a little corral there and each of the kids had two ewes. I think you had two or one. One or two. Yeah. I think anyhow. Anyway, we had each an year and sheep and when the folded ram. Dan would have his ewes would have two two lambs, and uh, in, in the in the fall then, and in fact we had all the menagerie of things that the Sunday school came out with their slides and they told the. The, the the Christmas story because we had the donkeys animals, and we yeah, had the, the ducks sheep and sheep and, horse, and yeah. so there were shepherds and uh, we never did get a copy of it yeah but uh, so it was a great place and Dan would take I think he took we sold them to a neighbor a neighbor bought them and he sold them for slaughter. The, so the, they, the they, lambs. Yeah, the lambs. So Mr. Uh, oh. the, the Mexican fellow, our friend. Um, yeah, he, next he, door neighbor. Uh, no, there's one couple down. Oh. So the kids never knew. We ran out of grass in the fall and they would uh, uh, sell their lambs and he, would, he bought Disney stock with his money. So that, that did all right, uh, and then the the water had been sold off the seven acres, but there were old orange trees there, and uh, so we got a post hole logger and built extensions, and the three kids would help turn the auger and then you drop a big iron thing down and that traps the water and we went down 33 feet and hit water. It's a, it was a bootleg well, you can't drill wells in California and here Randy or someone, you stop there, our neighbor, he's still using the well. For, for irrigation, yeah. yeah for so, we, we had a submersible pump and we brought the trees back so then we had a chainsaw and when, when we built and added on to the new home, built a bay window out the back and uh, had and we'd hatch the little ducks in, in the little incubator that you could plug in, you know, they used to have it and uh, so we got really interesting things. Yeah, it was great uh, as a kid growing up with uh, all the animals and the seven acres to mm -hmm. roam around on, on our bikes and all the things you wouldn't be allowed to do today in terms of uh, yeah, and shooting then BB guns. And, they had uh, BB guns. Yeah, setting, and so, and making and when I'd have them just sit in a circle and shoot out and sometimes they'd see bees and stuff and they'd shoot them but unfortunately we didn't get in any big uh, deal yeah and uh, so uh, that was uh, r really uh, really really great when our horse that we bought ended up where she was pregnant had a foal mm -hmm. uh, Dawn Katie was the horse mm -hmm. and one morning we looked out and I grew up on a farm and I didn't know she was in foal and here we looked out and there was a uh, a little Palomino horse, and we called her Dawn because we looked out at the back bay window, and there she was. And, um, and Dan was back to California a couple of years ago, and that's all houses now, and the one entrance to the street is named Dawn. <laughs> so that was yeah, that was nice. Yeah. So we then uh, being in real estate full-time was able to buy a uh, uh, 62 Chrysler so we stayed in the Chrysler and we bought it because I had an older car and the, the, my builder said you can't be driving around to that so 
he made me buy a new car, and, and we had enough money then. It was five years since we left Minnesota, and then we were able to go back. And two of the nephews uh, came out. This would be in 1962. Was that the first time we went back then? Yeah, it was 62. five years, 1962. And they had big horses, and that was one of the pic pictures. Of, you name them. Well, Roger and Dwayne were our cousins and then took us riding. So if that's 62, then I'd be like five, and Randy would be six, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. or four or five, yeah. But then back to... Uh, our home, our little ranch there, and I, we went to the police department and bought a mo old motorcycle mountain bike, and you can't license them to go on the road, but we took the wheels off and we made a sulky. And then our horse, uh, we went and uh, we were used to making sulkies because when we were in Worthington we had a great big collie dog and we took a steel chair and turned it upside down and put wheels on it and got a harness for the dog. And my daughter was in the parade, a, a really big parade, uh, riding in the little sound gone by the little, by the big sheepdog. And B and I was teaching at the high school. And at that time, the kids had little straws and little candies they could shoot through them. So I went as a clown, so in case I, someone I had alienated it didn't take it out of me and affect my daughter and my dog. <laughs> yeah, that was a special. I don't know why we didn't have that photo in the, yeah. in the series, but yeah, that was a special uh, Angela in the, uh, in the parade with dad. When we left Worthington, well, actually, we bought the dog in Tucson, where we weren't supposed to have the dogs. This was the collie, the, the big collie, collie Tammy. And, and she grew so fast that we were afraid we were going to get kicked out of the apartment, but we didn't. And all the way, to, we bought a 39 Plymouth, and driving through the mountains, she was more frightened than your mother. Oh, really? Right. Looking over, you know, and... And uh, so anyhow, so when we left Worthington, we didn't take the dog to California. So we gave it to a friend and it was too much for him in town. So he gave it to a farmer. So in 1962, when we returned, we went about 40 miles over to see where that dog was. And maybe you can tell all the people on the deal there. There's the dog. Well, that's Tammy the dog, and so Dad and Mom, Angela, Randy, and me, and then it looks like Cousin... It's a, it's a, probably Valerie Nearson. Yeah, it's Valerie or uh, probably Valerie or Bobby. Yeah. Uh, one of the Nearson girls were with us. Uh, so just... And then we had had a small, when we lived in Colorado, a small Shetland sheepdog that... We named Tammy as well, mm -hmm. in sort of honor of that first Tammy. Right. Uh, but then every year, so you were saying it started in 1962, every year we would travel in the travel trailer, take different routes that and go back to... That was until 1965, then we, st we bought a 29-foot carriage camper and we would travel. Oh, so initially we just uh, drove the car and yeah. then we had the travel trailer. In, in 1965. Oh, I know. Okay. So it's been a while since we last filmed. Um, I know Dad and I probably look younger, but um, anyway, we had left off on um, our family. I think we had you know, gone through the early years with the birth of Angela and Rand and me. And... Uh, uh, I'd sort of pick up there, maybe Dad, with okay. you know this. I think we had talked a little bit about the family travels over the summer. That uh, you know we had the trailer house and would go from California to 
Minnesota each summer, but Ooh. anyway. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, today is uh, the 18th of May, uh, 2016, and uh, Preston and Shelby tell me that we st they started in the October of 2014, uh, Rand Daniels producers, so I got a, just a little, probably thumbnail sketch just to see how we got where we are. So, uh, and I'll try to get just a small capsule of events. Uh, in uh, 1945, uh, the 1st of June, I graduated from Hills High School. And, and as I said, there were, I was in the top 10, and there were 13 people in the class, so I was in there somewhere. And uh, then, uh, I was drafted in the Army 18 years, 18 days later, and uh, I was discharged on November 20th, uh, 1946, and I started farming with my brother, and that lasted about six months, and then I enrolled in Augustana College and. Sioux Falls, South Dakota in 1940, uh, 19, yeah, 1947. And uh, as I was running hay balers, uh, I graduated in 1951. And uh, I had a couple of hay balers, and I bailed in that summer of 51. And uh, I had to bail flax straw way until October, so I didn't accept any teaching jobs. And then I accepted a youth director job in the Lutheran Church in Como Park in St. Paul, Minnesota. Then in May, I had to go back to the Baylors and uh, I bailed that summer, <clears throat> and at the end of the summer, I went to Estes Park mm -hmm. to a Lutheran Students Association meeting, and someone there hired me to be a graduate assistant at the University of Montana in Missoula. Mm -hmm. So I went to Missoula, and I guess there's an old Indian tradition that they sort of treat the meat and cure it like the Norwegians do in Norway, and the smell is awfully bad, and that's where you get the Chinook winds. And it wasn't the Chinook winds, but the uh, cold or something fouled up my sinuses, so I, which I had trouble with in Minnesota and had them burnt out. And so at Christmas time, I went to uh, Tucson, where I enrolled in graduate work at the University part-time at the University of Arizona and then uh, was substitute teaching. So then so then the next year then I did get a, a job and actually I, I filled out uh, a, a coaching job at Tucson Senior High School. Someone got some science award, and then the next, and then I was hired the next year at Rossford Junior High School, and I'm forgetting the exact years, but then I went back to Bale Hay, and we got a little ahead of the story here because we can't keep it all straight in our mind, but that's sort of when the good times started because uh, of. A friend of mine who I was in college with, uh, Robert Christensen, and I met him in a bar in Sioux Falls. Oh. And we went up to uh, the Arcota Ballroom 
and uh, that's when I met uh, this young lady, oh. and that's when the good thing started, and uh, we dated that summer, and then I went back to my teaching job, and uh, in Tucson or in and Tucson. Oh, okay. Yeah, and uh, did you get that? Uh -huh. Okay, in Tucson. And then I went back and we resumed our, our dating and uh, I got to thinking that I better not go away another year or she might not be there. <laughs> so uh, anyhow, we, we did discuss a few things before we were married and uh, Yana had uh, uh, a father that was a little involved in alcohol, and I think she also had a sister who was a war bride, and she got to do a lot of the baby stuff and taking care of a baby when she was in high school. And so when when Ramona came along, she wouldn't let Ramona do any laundry. <laughs> laundry or anything because she didn't want to get that. So anyhow, so uh, then uh, that then that I went back to teaching, and then the next year, then we got married, and so now that we can start uh, with here. Okay. So and we had covered. Uh, some of the early, you know, us um, early kids, but right. this one again was one of our trips back to Minnesota. Then right. would like you were thinking 1962 was right. This was, was this? This was in 1962. We got a got a new 62 Chrysler. It was five years since we uh, were married, and we went to uh, we traveled to Minnesota. And uh, and and I think then would we have we would have had the travel trailer then? In the yeah, 60s? we had a twenty nine foot camper trailer, and uh, someone said that you didn't have that on the back bump of the trailer. And uh, we did. Uh, we had the uh, rambling rise from Riverside was mm -hmm. our painted on the bumper, so, and then we went back, we, we did go back that year through Canada, I don't think. Yeah, well, each, each year we would take a different route, it seemed like, uh, you know, and stop along the way to, at places uh, to have lunch or uh, campgrounds and such. In fact, we went through Tucson. And there was a church there. We parked in the parking lot and went to church there. But uh, that uh, pastor there, I can't remember his name, but uh, he was in the market and he was in the vegetable produce department and he didn't wear a collar or anything, but he had a white shirt and dark pants and some old German guy came up and says, you're not taking very good of this produce. Clean up around here. And he says, well, he said, I think you should clean up too. He said, but I'm, I'm, I'm just a customer like you are. And then he introduced himself as a pastor. And then this old German guy started, started uh, apologizing. And uh, then a couple of weeks later, I was an usher in the church, and this guy called, and they said, well, he's at, in, in, at the service. And uh, anyhow, this uh, was a German in scientist, and he had all kinds of uh, patents. And, uh, and then the pastor went out to see him once, and that was it. And then the guy died. And the church got one million dollars from him, huh. and something. then that was all right. But he also gave a thousand, a million dollars to the 
animal shelter in Phoenix and one in Tucson. Oh, wow. And uh, so during that time, he borrowed a, a, a motorcycle from another guy and uh, asked me to go down to what is the mine? Aho. Oh, okay. And uh, I went down there and uh, held services and we helped start a, a Lutheran ch church down there. And uh, he, uh, I was going along in the motorcycle and over those little halls through cells, Arizona, and here was an Indian wagon. So I had to slow down after that a little. Oh. And uh, then... So that was back when you lived in Tucson before you got married right. to mom. Okay. Right. And so uh, then, <clears throat> so then uh, but we were talking about a uh, problem with alcohol, and uh, we said that we pledged that we tried to create a home that was uh, conducive for the young people for the problem to, to exist. And uh, so uh, I think then we could probably, I wanted to get that in. Yeah, no, and you certainly did a nice job of that, Dad. You know, we had a wonderful, wonderful home. So we were saying that, uh, uh, the next photo is one uh, from when Gregory was a toddler. So he was born in 1965. In January 9, 1965. And it's a photo of uh, Gregory yeah. with my, my mother, Rye. Emma Thompson Rye. And then our our pup in the background, Peaches the pup. Yeah, he had a. Notice it was a black lamb. It, it oh, and, and there's also a lamb yeah. in her lap. Uh, one of the we sheep. We bought seven acres in California, and in California, seven acres is a ranch. And so we had a barrage of animals there and uh, hatched out uh, had ducklings and had to teach them how to swim in the little kids' swimming pool. You know, <coughs> the good times. And uh, put in a new patio, and Randy stopped back 30, 40 years late, later to see the. Uh, when somebody is pouring new cement, there's always someone that comes along and writes their name in the cement, in the concrete, and so uh, all of the names and the dates of birth are there. Uh, back of us one, kids from... 11848 or no, no? 11245. Uh, no, oh, on Gramercy? Gramercy Place. Yeah, I don't remember the actual street address down, one, but yeah, so four, there five. was the signature of us kids in the cement. Yeah. And then on the on the acreage then, or the little ranch we had, we had uh, a horse and uh, sheep and uh, a, a goat, goat, a little goat, goat, goat the, the yes, the goat, and the donkey, uh, we might have talked about that, but... Yeah. Cinnamon, the donkey for mom. Right. You got mom that on her birthday, I think. Right. And um, she got me the goat on my birthday. Yeah. And the goat. The, yeah. The, we had such a menagerie that uh, Hope Luther Church, it was Robert Miller, the right, pastor. Right. They came out in the old days, had slides, and they used all of our animals to portray the Christmas story for showing at the church. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. And here's a nice photo of, of the back uh, or the living room or family room at uh, Gramercy with uh, Angie and Rand and I and, and Greg. Again, Greg's just a toddler, so I suppose this would be maybe 1966, maybe. No, maybe even uh, after Greg was uh, Greg was born, uh, we moved in, uh, the daughter was in the hospital having Greg when we bought it, but we needed an extra bedroom and instead of having a bay room, a bay window in the front of the house, we had a bay room at the 
back of the house looking out into the field. And uh, I lived in a farm and I'd seen animals in full, horses in full. But my partner says, it looks like your uh, horse Katie is in fold and I, we didn't say anything. I didn't think anything about it. And one morning we opened the window and there she had a little, uh, what is the Indian ponies? Uh, Appaloosa. An Appaloosa colt out there and born at dawn. So we named her Dawn and uh, Daniel was back a couple of years ago and he stopped by there and the new subdivision to get into that subdivision the, the street is called Dog. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, the acreage now has been converted into homes, mm -hmm. but yeah. So, but it was sure a nice piece of property. Yeah. And, and, uh, and we were really poor parents because each kid had a pellet gun. And Probably Angie didn't have one, did yeah, she? Well, did yeah. she? Yeah. No. And they'd sit in a circle and shoot at bees and stuff like that. And uh, they, uh, there was something else. That, and then they had pocket knives and that, you know, so we would, they wouldn't be let into schools today. No, no. So, when well, here's another family photo. This one, uh, uh, I wouldn't know what the date is on this. It it's, uh, must have been maybe a church photo. Probably a church, church photo. Church photo. It's really nice. You know, Angie's, you know, is, uh, looks so grown there. Right. Um, it's such she, such a nice photo. She of was at uh, Foothill Junior High School. And maybe this would be a good time to uh, go through the. Uh, uh, a Angela passed away at Christmas time in 1968 mm -hmm. of a cerebral, a brain hemorrhage, uh, starting with uh, Randy. Then, uh, when they uh, would would you go into that? When. Uh, Randy enrolled at the University of Colorado in Boulder. I went over with him and he looked at a, a student lodging and it was on the third floor of a big old house and he'd have to go down to the basement to do a steal and I didn't think it was a real nice atmosphere for, you know, being good and there was a condominium subdivision that was sort of in semi-foreclosure, and we put an offer on that, and they had a hard time getting a release, but finally before Randy went to college, we got a release so he could move in, and he uh, had one room and he rented out the other two. And then the second year, uh, Dan went to Boulder, and he and Randy had lived together in one room and ran out the other two. Now, uh, the MIA is the highest appraisal uh, functioning body in the United States, and each year they give out nationwide three five thousand uh, dollar scholarships, and uh, two of them happen to go to. Boulder, Colorado, and two of them happened to go to our sons, Randy and Dan. Hmm. So uh, those guys uh, more or less took care of themselves. And then uh, uh, Ramona, uh, I got a couple of, without her signing, I got a couple of uh, uh, loans for her and then I defaulted on them so for up until the last couple of years the the IRS has been trying to lower my social security but then I had this good story to spin and evidently they 
they did succeed and now they figure I'm too old and so they stopped bothering me. And then uh, Ramona, that, that's who we got the scholarship for. And uh, can that, we, maybe we can go back and talk about, you, you're sort of talking get, about us boys, aren't you? Yeah. And the kids. But I wanted to go to the right. education wanna, part with all of them. Okay. And then, uh, yeah. Gregory? Uh, oh, yeah, Gregory, uh, he uh, uh, decided to, he went to junior college and then he, we, I t took him around to different uh, uh, hearings on chiropractic medicine and he was into that. He had, uh, he was a backstroke swimmer at the high school and his back got all tied up. And he went to a chiropractor who looked like Superman out of uniform. So what's the guy's name? Jack Anderson. Yeah, but who's who's Superman? When oh, I'm not sure. Clark, Clark Kent. Clark, Clark Kent. Yeah. And then his wife was a nurse, and they kept telling Greg he'd make a good duck. And he said, "Oh, what is this?" And Greg is able to spin a few tales too, and. Uh, uh, on Christmas, he told Ramona, and Ramona was not very old, and he told her that he'd go to the office party of the doctor, and they're going to come in the limousine, and she said, you are not, and and they did come in the limo, and uh, then, uh, so that was, uh, uh, she, she started to believe him when he spun a tail after that. Mm -hmm. And so there's a one thing that hangs a little, he not a little he heavily on my heart. He had, he was a, he still was sort of a burden with a, a loan of, of a college loans. And then Ramona, as I said, then I signed a couple. We probably don't need to go back over that. <laughs> but the video is not on the financing of our college. But you know what we didn't really talk about was um, well, we, we talked about as kids, and so Angela passed in uh, over Christmas in nineteen sixty eight, and that was one thing that I'm really thankful for that we did the things that we wanted to do. Uh, in 1962, we traveled. Uh, and uh, we went from Riverside, California to Hills, Minnesota. And then uh, uh, when Daniel was born, we had a lady named Caroline Kennedy Caroline, uh, Caroline uh, from, and she now in 62 lived in uh, Fargo, North Dakota. So we went through Fargo and looked up uh, Caroline Leland, mm -hmm. who was a help down during your birth. Yeah. And uh, then went across the Canadian Highway and then. Uh, uh, in 1965, then in June or July, uh, and Greg was uh, six months old, and we stopped at the trailer and uh, uh, put his diapers in the garbage along the deal, and the, the bears came and ate his diapers, <laughs> and the kids sort of liked that, Randy and Dan. And, that and was, Angela yeah, funny. Like that. Well, that was, did we go through Yellowstone? Was that oh, yeah. uh, on that yeah, trip yeah, then? No. Yeah, or? it's 1962. And, well, yeah, uh, and then the other one with the castle, the, the other one in Utah. Oh, um, one of the mon national monuments? Uh, yeah. It, in Utah? It, uh, it's the other famous park in Utah. Hmm. One of the others. Not and sure, anyway. I know on the way to 
and the way to Salt Lake City, uh, Angela had a spell win. Oh, I didn't. And no. uh, it it worked itself out. Yeah. But it it, it lasted for a day, and we just didn't you know have any idea what it was. But uh, then we went to see. Oh, and that was in '65, and then we went to. Uh, St. Louis, uh, to uh, Kansas, Lawrence, Kansas, to, uh, uh, let's see, no, the, my partner, my uh, roommate from college was a, uh, a pharmacist in uh, uh, a Kansas town, and uh, we stopped to see him, and Gregory had a got the flu or something and he was uh, in the hospital for three, four or five days. He had it quite quite serious. And Gregory, uh, when he was born, uh, he they had to stay an extra week in the hospital and somewhere we've got a film of Angela and Randy and Dan running home from a movie of them running home from school and bursting through the door to see this new blessed event in our family. Yeah, because every day we were in the home and he wasn't there yet. And yeah. one, one day you had sort of set up the filming, you know, dad was who had made films back then. Uh, yeah. yeah. It was a cute film of running and, uh, that time when we got home, there was a note on the door to be quiet because the baby was sleeping. Yeah. So <laughs> it was really sweet to actually when Gregory came home. Yeah, yeah Greg had he was just sensitive uh, when he was young, or he had those spells or bad mm -hmm. headaches and things mm -hmm. as a young person too. That's where Jack Anderson had helped him so much with mm -hmm. uh, getting relief. So he you know went into chiropractic, but so but um, you know I know it's hard, but. You know, so then Angela had a spell uh, in California where she uh, went into the hospital. That would have been maybe 67. Yeah. Where she was in the hospital yeah. and then they diagnosed the... Yeah, it was a Saturday, Saturday after... Uh, well, we were talking about Angela. Yeah. Then Dad and... It was a Saturday morning and... Uh, she had gone to the bathroom and she was smelling some perfume and uh, she thought there was a big publicity about drugs and she was smelling the perfume and she thought maybe she did something wrong oh. and she felt badly and we went to the doctor's office and sat around and waited our turn and when the doctor saw her he took her right to the uh, uh, emergency ward and she had a aneurysm in her throat and they did save her and uh, she had a little limp in the right leg I think and uh, she was everything was going great and in fact uh, then uh, we went down to visit our dear friends Keith and Lois uh, a pharmacist and cousin in uh, uh, Whittier. Whittier, yeah. And they had a tire swing, and Angela got on, and of course, what happened? They never spooked before, but she spooked then and went into the chain link fence, and uh, Uncle Tommy was there, and then uh, and the fence was torn down, the horse was a little excited and I had Uncle Tommy talk the horse down while I unhooked all of the all of the, the harnesses and 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 I don't forgot who took Angela away right then but yeah so when you look back you know <laughs> when like you said you know we had so many wonderful times together as a family um, you know uh, when Angela was, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all those years and so many travels and, and going did to, so many wonderful going things. Going to Laguna Beach. Yeah, we'd go to the beach every summer, or it seemed like every summer. Um, 
Or and, uh, Catalina Island with uh, Duane. Duane, yeah, exactly. So we had had lots of special times. Angela was a special girl. We don't talk about her, um, in, you know, but she was as sweet as could be. She was just a little angel that, uh, you know, I don't think she ever did anything wrong. The only thing she ever got in trouble for was when Randy and I got her in trouble for we were fighting and apparently she didn't stop us or something, not that it was her job, but that was, she got scolded that one time and it just crushed her because she just wasn't, um, she had not ever done anything mm -hmm. uh, wrong, she, but she was a gentle soul. And our uh, 62 Chrysler didn't have factory, it had a little unit under the dash. Yeah, and so we took a long, uh, a, uh, Pack and clean her hose to, to the back so the kid could change, save the air in the summer trips. And Angela had to sit in the middle so to keep the boys from you know, mixing it up. Yeah. No, she was always stuck in the middle to keep us from bugging each other. Um, and do you remember anything else about Angela, Dan? Well, from we, were looking, or? we were looking for a place to start a, a campground. And, oh, and she drew up pictures of what it should be, you know. Oh, I didn't know That's that. when we went to uh, the one in, uh, outside of uh, in Colorado, the museum where the, the, where the old Indian relics are. Oh, uh, outside of where, Dad? Outside of Durango. Oh, uh, Telluride or? No. Uh, it, it's uh, oh. where the old Indian road, <laughs> old Indian. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Pueblo Grant. No, it's, yeah. I know what you're talking about now, but I can't remember the yeah. name of it. Um, <coughs> in fact, me. that was in the, <coughs> yeah, okay. Well, um, anything else you remember about Angie, Dad, or maybe you and Angie were real close. Mm -hmm. Mom always said this growing up, and when she was young, um, but um, so, um, well, uh, she said one thing that uh, it's hard to relate, that she said when she got married, she wanted to marry someone like me. Oh, that's so sweet, Dan. She was a sweet, sweet girl. There were quite a few factors. Uh, one was the thought maybe go back to giving, them, go back to teaching rather than just selling. And then Daniel was uh, in sixth grade football at uh, Twin, uh, not Twin Hills. Was it Twin Hills? In oh, the last place you were at. Okay. And as in football, they could only play after dark because the smog was too bad to play in the afternoon. And then we could only see Mount. Uh, uh, I don't ever Arrowhead. remember. Yeah, I don't even remember seeing mountains. Uh, now the skies are so much clearer with pollution control. Yeah. But I don't Lake remember. Arrowhead. We could you could see, see that mountain yeah. on, on a clear day. Yeah, 183 days out of the year. So that's why we decided to move to Colorado and uh, go back to teaching. And uh, uh, on the way to. Uh, so and that was 1970, actually. Right. Uh, so, um, and, uh, so we had stayed in California for like a year uh, before we moved. Right. And I just we just, when Jim Smith and I dissolved our partnership, and uh, then Ramona, there weren't seat belts and yet, but. We had gotten a, like a leash where you could hold onto the kid and we put it in the little jump seat in the front, you know. And she she rode and uh, I, I drove the uh, 
62 Chrysler pull, uh, 69 pulling a, a camper. We still had a camper, and we stopped at uh, there's a a 101 gas station in Wyoming that's supposed to have 100 pumps in Little America. Oh, okay. And we stopped, and she got out and grabbed it out of the pump. A pump, and we had the prior loose. They put her out in the car. She wasn't gonna. She, wasn't she gonna, had enough of riding in the car. She wasn't gonna get back in that car. Well, that was was that the trip then, uh, where we went through Loveland and decided that's where we wanted to live. Or well, the year before that? we had gone through. The year before we'd gone through and we'd camped up at a power plant that the. In 1975, flood that killed 140 people. We we went across the bridge, camped there, and uh, we thought that'd be a nice place to live. Uh, in Loveland, yeah. Uh, we had, uh, this is the town in Colorado where we moved to. I I so we, was it we, up by the dam store? Was that or right past the dam store? There was an art uh, 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 mobile. No, it, it was just a park, and we could oh, okay. It. Okay, and, uh, but anyway, that's by the Thompson River, sort of a, right. yeah, um, sort of a mixed message there. We didn't move there because of the death of the people from the flood. That no, but when, when the flood came, uh, we did have a cabin that drank halfway up, and about three months before, uh, the, the boys were in high school, and we wanted to go up there, and they didn't want to always go anymore. And so we had the little kids, and we didn't want to leave the big kids down alone. And so we sold it cash. And the neighbor, the guy to the right, uh, uh, he was retired Greyhound bus driver. We sold his house, and two months later, the homes were gone. From the flood, yeah. That was in 1976. It was the year yeah, I graduated. July 31st. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, and the the film we'd gone to a movie that night, and uh, the the name of the movie was The Search for Noah's Ark. Oh. And we could had to take a little detour to get to our house, and we owned a motel. Then, who the guy, uh, you you get the lady who takes care of the motel. And the husband was sort of a drinker, and so you hire one people, but you get two. And about 9.30 he called and said, okay, the police are here. They're moving the people out. And I said, oh, let me talk to your wife. You know, I thought he was, you know, a little wound up, but it, it was true. And that, that night we had 19 people in our basement, including a blind lady. Yeah. yeah. Because that the one hotel was by a irrigation canal. It was that that they were trying to. But it was on high ground. That. It wasn't damaged. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, and, we've sort of jumped around. Yeah. We can go back. To, but they're all tied yeah, to so Ramona. They're tied. Yeah, back to Mona. So we, here's a picture. Uh, we're sort of cut off, but it's it must be. I would guess it was like an Easter Sunday, maybe at uh, the uh, Hunter's Mr. house. Mr. Bob. Yeah, but it's got Ramon in it with her little bonnet for Easter, which is sweet. Um, we uh, had bought a home over the telephone, so in the, Colorado. Yeah, in Colorado, and the people thought they, were, they didn't want any Cal California people coming there anyhow. But they thought it was really crazy, so we I went to the lumberyard and asked for someone to finish out our basement. So Mr. Bob there came and uh, he was working in the basement and Ramona would work, walk away with his tools, you know. So he said, oh, he told his wife, you've got to see this little girl. And finally she came to see him and they didn't have anyone and our grandparents were gone, so we sort of adopted them as the grandparents, and then, then my uh, in California there was a lady who was in charge, uh, the secretary for people that owned three thousand acres, and I judged Christmas lights with her, and then 
I was one of the realtors who was allowed to go in her uh, office to talk about selling some of their land. Otherwise, she couldn't get in. And I went to tell her we, we were going to go to Colorado. And she said, well, there's where my folks live. So they were in their late 90s, and uh, so then we sort of adopted them too. And what we was their name again? I'm sorry. Uh, what was uh, the Hatches? Hatches, yeah. Yeah, Grandma and Grandpa Hatch. They were sweet yeah. little older folks. And, and then he, uh, he, uh, he lived to be 99 uh, years and six months and yeah, and he got sick, and his daughter's in California, and I went to see him and said, don't let him put me in a hole, you know. And, well, I didn't have anything to say about it, but they had to put him in a hole. And he didn't make it. To, he, he was about a month short. So uh, he could make it a yeah. hundred. <laughs> so that was 1970 when we moved to Colorado. Yeah. And, yeah. Where, and so Dad went back to teaching... Uh, in Colorado, and but then also slowly got into um, real estate yeah. again, also, and and uh, and also you were on the planning commission, and well, and they, uh, I saw an article they were uh, starting a housing authority, and I went to the University of Loma Linda, the La Sierra branch, and these are. The people who talk to you are all professors. So I wrote a book, a thesis about the Federal Housing Administration, and they didn't know anything about that. So they couldn't ask me any questions. So uh, we got to Colorado, so I said, oh, that was some, something to do, which I had something in it. So, but I was from California, and they gave out five positions, and they all four of them got five-year term, and they gave me a one-year term just in case, you know. Yeah. So then later, then I became chairman of the housing authority, and we did uh, put in uh, sixty elderly homes that was claiming for the people as that had lost their homes in the flood. That's mm -hmm. what, it did end up that way entirely, but it helped some of them. Yeah. And then, and then the mayor appointed me to the planning commission and the, 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 the board member says, we don't want a realtor on there. And, uh, uh, the mayor told them the the realtors are want the banker to be on there. They didn't want him either, so so they picked me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did a lot of good there. So, well, so in Colorado, then us boys, well, we all finished school and such. Uh, I, the next photo is from yours and mom's twenty uh, fifth wedding anniversary okay. with with Mona, you know, growing up. Right. Uh, Greg and Mona were best buddies uh, growing up in Colorado and and he uh, used to make movies with his little ten millimeter camera. Yeah, with the little camera. Greg and Mona would make movies, uh little films with the dog and the uh Tamaru. Yeah. And uh, they had lots, always had lots of fun. But uh, and uh, we had a pinball machine in the basement, and the kids would put the dog on the pinball machine, and then that was a puppy handicap. <laughs> push the dog around. And we don't know who was the most uh, excited, the dog or the kids. Yeah, Greg. And I Mona. think it's in Gregory's basement now. Yeah, Gregory and Mona sure had lots of fun. Yeah. Uh, other Colorado stories, Dad, that uh, you think of? Uh, you, you know, so he, he, Dad left teaching, went back into the real estate. Right. Uh, and uh, um, and then Mom uh, started doing the property management right. at the 
of the apartments and rentals that and, and in California I was property management broker for the Veterans Administration uh -huh. for the 500 we possessed homes in Riverside and San Bernardino mm -hmm. and then in, in Colorado I was uh, property management broker for the FHA re repossessions in Northern Colorado. Oh, that's right. I forgot so, about so that. So Greg, Greg that we had to pick up and then, so, so there wasn't, what do you call it when you have the family, giving the family jobs? Oh, nepotism. Nepotism. Or? So Greg, my son Gregory, it's our son Gregory is Gregory Nelson Reich is a, that was my dad's name, uh, Nelson, middle name. So I'd get in my work clothes and we'd go out and clean up a house and then, and then I'd make up. Okay, uh, one of the great minds of the 20th century said that uh, I don't want to belong to any group that would have me as a member because the standards are too low. That was Groucho Marx said that. And uh, I belong to the Lovely Board of Realtors and I never went to any meetings. And uh, one week my wife started working on me saying, we're going to go to the Realtors meeting. I said, well, what's this deal about? So that was in 1976. And then I, I was named Realtor of the Year. And I think everyone fell over, including me. And then, uh, what was the second point? Oh, yeah, I started uh, building something before. What is it Jimmy Carter's on? Uh, what does he build? Uh, Habitat for Humanity? Yeah. So, a couple years before that, uh, I formed something called Home Ownership for through sweat equity and uh, so the acronym was house and we built four homes with the high school uh, class building them, and then we got them to the low income people were no down and so the city manager of Loveland that year won the international city management award uh, because of this project of mine. And so the next year that I was teaching, they had an intern from Boulder, a graduate student. And so I said, okay, how about letting me intern someone to your intern? Well, this student had stolen a car and unfortunately he crossed the state lines into Wyoming. So the first day he came to school, the principal came and says, okay, you know, watch that guy, keep your eyes on him. And so uh, I, in, I had to class the first hour in the morning. So I interned him to the city manager's intern. And I told the kid, you know, I'm marking you here. So if you don't come in the second period, I'm pretty big trouble. So he went and interned and pretty soon he was riding with the police and he was saying, Oh, those guys are okay. I said, oh, you can't trust them. You can't trust them. I don't put any faith in them. So, <laughs> well, you always helped kids that needed. You know, you gave them a boost when they needed it. Uh, when you were teaching, always, you know, sort of uh, looked out for the kids that were, you know, hadn't got any uh, encouragement. Uh, you know, and that certainly helped. I forgot the name of that young fellow. Did you remember? I don't. I don't remember his yeah, name, but yeah. But then so. the other one was uh, the Indian kid, uh, Claude Hunsinger. Right. Uh, Clyde Hunsinger, and uh, our teacher had a very good student, her son, and the faculty was trying to put him in the student body president. No, and the kids know what's going on, so they. They sent Clyde up uh, to be the deal, and all the teachers said, my God, we're really going to impress him. So I had an extra room in my class, and for two weeks, I had two, three guys in there working with him. 
and uh, that practicing his speech or yeah or for the for, for parents night oh <laughs> so and he was a good looking guy he had a brown suit on and the retiring principal went out there and bumbled and did an awful job so anyone would look good coming after him but Clyde came out and he just knocked him down uh, I, and then the two ladies uh, that were telling the kids to quit smoking all the time, that smoked in the, uh, you know, the PE teachers. teachers yeah. uh, the next day they said, my, oh, he did wonderful. And I said, you know, are you going to tell him? Which I probably did. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Enough said. So, anyway, we had lots, we've had lots of nice times, wonderful times in Colorado. Oh, wonderful. Um, here's just... More, we're sort of wrapping up on our family. Here's a nice uh, picture of of the family. I don't know when that would have been uh, uh, close to Mona's graduation or maybe Greg's graduation. I, I, don't, I don't know, but um, you know, my guess is Randy and I were in college at this point. And Greg and Mona were in high school. Um, uh, that's I don't a good really picture. Know. Yeah, it's a nice photo of everyone and and Mona Karen and um, and um, and then the, the again I guess sort of wrapping up on Colorado. This was a photo of when the family uh, from Norway came yeah. to visit. But I was it like Nels uh, uh, or uh, when I went to Iran in 1976 to sell a shopping center in Denver, and, and then I went to Norway to see my father's home, and I visited him there then. And uh, then, in, uh, they, later, they came to America and uh, to visit their cousins in Sioux Falls, and uh, I told them, we'll meet you in uh, the Black Hills, you know, halfway, you know, but Donna said, you know, they want to come to Colorado, so just be quiet. And, and they they came down in a extended Dodge van, and there were 20 of them. And oh, my God. They all stayed at the motel. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, rent-free. And uh, so I I get, went back to see them two years ago uh, in the rest home. And, Oh, the ones. Uh, Rug and Ingeborg's Ingeborg. in the rest home. And, uh -huh. and so Palmer stays there too. Oh. So. But she came from Norway after World War II, her and her aunt, and lived at our place. And this Palmer was a farmer in the neighboring town, and the sons of Norway have meetings, and she was there in her Norwegian costume dress. And he said, My God. I'm going to marry her, but I got to wait till fall till I get the scrubs out. <laughs> and he said, and, and I'll do it again. And that's uh, what he told me this two, no, that's, two, two that's years sweet. ago. <laughs> oh, that's cute, Dad. So, well, that sort of wrapped up the photos of, um, right. of our family. But so now we can, we'll go on to Aunt uh, Beverly. Right. <laughs> So Beverly was the next child after you right. on the family. So we don't have, well, we've had pictures of her as a, a baby early on. But right. Here's a nice, here, like her high school. High picture. school graduation. So Aunt Beverly um, then went on to get become a nurse. At Sioux Valley Hospital, she took the summer course and then worked for four years to become an RN. And, um, and that's such a good picture of her. And it looks so much like when you look at her, look, you see sort of Valerie yes, and uh, Sue and Bobby and, you, and you her, her daughters. And uh, Beverly met and married then. Robert Nearson. They, they were in the same class in high school. And uh, can you... Uh, do you have any stories you remember about, well, you know, Uncle Bob or Uncle Bev early on? Or? Well, uh, the uh, 
his dad uh, ran the, the graded, the graded uh, roads, and uh, he must have had some mechanical abilities because he built a little tiny tractor, like a toy tractor with an engine in it for his Bobby, dad, and we his... just all uh, just was uh, envious because yeah. he had a little tractor. He, he, uh, Uncle Bob. Was he adopted by his his family? Was that no. or okay? I'm there was getting that wrong. his family went to uh, uh, Minneapolis, and uh, he wanted to stay in Hills, and he stayed with his uncle Albert. Okay, and then then I that's how probably his uh. Bob's dad got the road grader job because his da his dad was a county commissioner. <laughs> his dad. uncle was a county okay. commissioner. All but right. uh, and then when they went on their honeymoon, I got to take care of their cows. Uh, they had milk cows, and and uh, I took care of them. Now uh, Beverly, uh, she she was she uh, became an RN and. I worked uh, as an RN, and I forget exactly where she worked always, but later, after we started retiring, uh, she worked for uh, uh, Iowa Beef, and she had to write up the uh, accident reports. So uh, that caused a problem. And we had bought a buggy like... Uh, Sorry, with the fringe on top, but it was just a little single one, and we put that in the front yard. And Angela and Greg, uh, Angela had a sign, "Lost Dutchman Mine." This was for Halloween. For Halloween, and I don't know why. Even in California, people had heard of the Lost Yeah, I forgot about Dutch that. Mine. It was sort of like you know the kids would come up to the buggy for the Halloween for, candy. For, hand out the candy. Yeah, that was that was nice. And, um, and she had a, a beard on it. <laughs> uh, As like an old miner. Yeah. That's right, I forgot that. That was a good one, wasn't it, Dad? Yeah. So, um, and um, I'm just trying to think of other things with Angela. She loved well, her. Well, she had she a science a, project at the school. And she sang, she sang in the choir at the Twin Hill. I know at uh, the Colette Church or at Colette, Colette, Colette School and at the Hope Lutheran Church. Yeah, she too. was an excellent. Well, I think you guys were in the choir a little too for a little while. At the church, yeah. At the church, world. yeah, yeah. So, well, because after she passed, we used to pick up those two girls down at uh, by Colette that went in the choir. Oh, and, and take and them it, with us to yeah, practice. So that after she was gone, you guys came and we picked them up. Yeah. And you went to choir. Um, so in um, the Christmas of 1967, then you, you and Mama decided we'd go back to Hills for Christmas okay. uh, so uh, we would be with the family. That was it because you were wanted her to see the no, cousins and no, things, just or it was just that had, was we planned? We had for Christmas with our kids being there. Yeah, so I think that uh, I almost wonder if the one photo uh, that we were looking at, uh, there was a cousin's photo. Oh, yeah. I almost think that that was the Christmas. Uh, uh, yeah, it was. It would have been. One, one was at the... Uh, this was at Vivian's, so is that at, or at Nori's? That was at Nori's, and, uh, yeah. So this photo, it was Cousins, it would have been that Christmas, Angie's hair was cut short because she had had the spell in California, and so this is probably, you know, one of the last photos yeah. of Absolutely. Angie, just, um, we were at Uncle John's in Sioux Falls. Johnny and Bev's in Johnny Sioux and Falls. Johnny and Bev Enderman, John his brother. 
And she had... Um, and uh, she uh, lay down and, uh, and uh, I guess, she, and that was, uh, I had a toothache, I was going to go to the dentist, and she was saying, oh, uh, so she was taking care of me, and then I, she, I guess uh, she then uh, became unconscious, and they took her to the Sioux Valley Hospital, and uh, she, she never did uh, recover. But she gave us so much joy. And we're thankful for that. So after about five or six months, uh, Donna felt she wouldn't be able to carry it to another child, and she wanted a girl. So uh, we decided to adopt the child, and uh, the uh, we had to get recommendations from a bunch of people. And the lawyer took care of it, and uh, it, it, we we'd asked. Anyhow, uh, we asked for a child that was unlike Angela. <laughs> she wasn't a belonger. Anyhow, so then they found this girl, and uh, where well, you you and mom had talked about maybe adopting a little Hispanic girl back then. Because of Janice, the yeah, neighbor. Yeah, because of the neighbor, but, uh, or the her little friend. Back then, um, on adoptions, you know, a lot of kids were not um, really seen as adoptable, you know. The, well, the cat, uh, we uh, were Lutheran, or, and the child, if it was Spanish, would probably be Catholic. Well, yeah, but also there were more, you know, some of the uh, minority children weren't being adopted, yeah. you know. And so you and Mom had talked about maybe adopting a little Hispanic girl because of Angie's friend, Dad? Across How did that the work? street, Janice. Her little friend. But uh, then they came up with uh, uh, this child, and uh, she's so bit part. So Bobby ended in her heritage, and we went down to uh, Hammett and their uh, after we were notified, and uh, and then we when they asked us to come and view to the uh, California Home Home Society. And a, a doctor in Cuba started it in the 1890s to, to help place uh, children. And so we sat down at home before we went down and said, you know, this is a child we're going to take because are, are we going to go down and say, oh, I don't want that one, you know. Yeah. And so. It's pretty hard to go see a little yeah. newborn infant and, and, yeah. and say no. Yeah. So uh, then, before she was even a year old, she had uh, influenced so many people. Uh, a neighbor that I taught with in Worthington, Minnesota, and he moved to California, and I sold him a house. And they had three girls, and they said, Well, if the rise can get a girl, why can't we get a boy? And they did. Yeah. Uh, Phyllis and um, uh, anyhow. Uh, the Pokes. Hoax. Hoax, yeah. And then our well, brother-in-law, too. Yeah. Our brother-in-law, uh, now his brother Jim and Sandra uh, Enderman, they we can adopt, and uh, well, they lived in South. Well, I, I leave that part out. Anyhow, they adopted uh, 
a Korean child, and uh, her name is Tanya, and she's still with us. And then at the junior high where I was uh, teaching at that time when when we moved to Colorado, and we went up to our cabin, and Ramona was in the back seat talking to the Norman Clump, the band instructor. Mm -hmm. She was going away, and boom, she just so tired out, she just fell asleep. And they were so taken. And so they get started to adopt a child. They didn't have any children. And then a couple of years later, we uh, ran into them traveling back to Minnesota. Somewhere in Nebraska, we stopped at a restaurant, and here they were, and they, she had gotten pregnant. They had a child of their own, so uh -huh. just thinking about help. When we, so we sort of jumped ahead with what a wonderful influence she had in terms of other people, but we never really showed a picture of little uh, uh, Ramona. No. We sort of skipped ahead, and this is, of course, her as a toddler. Um, we should have had some photos of... Ramona as an infant, she was just and still is always mm -hmm. cute as can be, but that again more like a toddler. But she just always had the biggest, has always had the biggest beautiful smile. She and put a good friendly. one on Facebook on Mother's Day. Yeah, of her as a yeah. baby. I, I don't know why I don't have baby pictures of, of uh, Ramona, but uh, so Ramona joined us and um, Ramona Karen. Ramona Karen and uh, uh, named after the play that dad and mom liked in California, uh, the Ramona Pageant. And in 1878, uh, there was a lady called, uh, her, she wrote a novel about the Indians were being dis exterminated and she wrote uh, a novel and trying to bring attention to how we're treating the Indians. And she wanted social change to come about, but it turned out to be a romance. And it was published all over the world in 1880. And uh, the lady felt that she had, she had uh, failed. The name of the book was Ramona. Yes. And I have can't come up with the name right now, but for when Angela was still alive, uh, I liked drama, and we went to the Ramona pageant when Ramona, uh, Angela was still alive, and uh, you go through there, and all of a sudden, about five hundred Indians pop up in the mountain around you, and. Uh, and when they put on the production, yeah, it's yeah. pretty dramatic, isn't it, it? It really was. And now I've been back a couple times uh, last summer, Randy, and it's my our son Randy and uh, his my grand our, our grandson Court. Uh, I was going to meet Court, but I don't think they wanted me to drive <laughs> alone, so they arranged to. Ran his father Randy came from San Antonio, and we drove out to California to get. Uh, and went to the pageant. So, yeah, and uh, so Helen Helen Hunt Jackson. There you go, author, and she uh, didn't have Ramona. a easy job. The first officer of the U.S. Navy that she married went down in the first submarine, and he <laughs> didn't come up. Mm. And then her, she married again, and. He was killed, and then she moved to Colorado Springs and married an older man. And she petitioned to Congress and to to uh, 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 treatment, uh, and uh, so she uh, had. Uh, and that pageant is about a five Sundays in May and maybe three, four thousand, and the, sort of like the Red Rock Stadium. Right, right. Beautiful. Yeah, so Ramona, um, when we maybe talk about what uh, the transition then, Dad, uh, from California 
we adopted Mona in California, and uh, we had suffered the loss of Angela, of course, but, uh, you know, you and Mom well, we, were making the adjustment through all of this, but decided then to move to Colorado. Yeah, and, uh, I decided rather than just selling, and, uh, we would change, of course. So, uh, she wrote up the injury reports a little too accurately, so they got rid of her. <laughs> I mean, they wanted to soften the reports and yeah. say it turned in, so I'm very well. proud of her. She said, and, and then she did hurt her back at the rest home and, and uh, was threatened not to turn in a, a report because uh, they did it in a clean record, but she did, so I was again very proud of her. And she, she uh, uh, one real funny story, none of us got, to, we lived about two miles from town, and who, when they got two dozen egg cases, that'd be 36 times two, about 72 dozen of eggs, and carry those crates and into town, and I guess mother would go, and then whoever drove. And uh, when she'd come back, and she'd say, well, I saw the Johnsons, or someone, and then Beverly would say, did they ask for me? <laughs> and, That's uh, sweet. They had the, That's when she was young. Oh, yeah, real, yeah. real young. Oh, that's cute. Real young, and, and then her, her daughters, her three daughters. Well, here's a good photo of the oh, girls okay. as, as very young. So um, Valerie, Roberta, and Susan, uh, real cute Christmas photo. Right. Of, and her, her, her other grandma was... Uh, always having them uh, per perform and do little singing and sketches, you know. Yeah. And uh, Bobby admitted it that she was a little bashful about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and Bob had the dairy farm, or right. a dairy farm, so they never got to travel. We didn't, well, we would yeah. go see them, but yeah, yeah that was pretty. Uh, well, then uh, when one story. He, just, he was selling milk, and then he wanted to sell a higher grade or something. So the government inspector came out and said, okay, uh, that outhouse over there, you'll have to move it 100 feet more. And uh, his, his dad told him, well, that's fine, he said, but when nature calls, I still go behind the cows. <laughs> in the barn. Well, in, in the <laughs> barns had, yeah. for a milking uh, yeah. milking barn, they had the gutters and such right. design. Yeah. But uh, and, we and always then, liked going to Bob and, and Bev's farm to see the girls, but right. then also, because they always had lots of cats, and, and it was always fun seeing the dogs, and, right. or the, the cows, I should say. And, and then... Uh, sometime in the 70s, I think, or 60s, the farmers, uh, with all new government regulations, and there was sort of a bad economic times, and uh, Minneapolis, the capital of St. Paul, was about 200 miles away, but he was one of hundreds of people that drove his tractor all the way up there and oh, Bob did. parked in front of the capital. Yeah. And uh, he... he uh, uh, the, uh, and then his, uh, so, but uh, the, the uh, I had one other stuff too, but the uh, Bobby, uh, after she graduated from college, and her uh, uh, archaeologist, uh, there. She had too much education. She couldn't get a job during that period, so she had to eliminate the things that she'd gone to college. And she worked in a photo and sports store uh, in Fort Collins and uh, stayed at our place for a while. Yeah, that was that was a special. And she and so we've been really close to Bobby. And yeah. Well, all of the girls. To all of the girls. Yeah. And, 
So and close. they had a uh, tragic too. They uh, they lost her sister Susan to ovarian cancer maybe about ten years ago. Yeah. But they were fine. Sweet, um, sweet girls. Oh, and then right over by Elmer's farm, there was a Nearson farm nearby, and that was so long ago that that people had a cemetery on their own farm. And so Bob used to go out and take care of that cemetery of people that I, I, I had, I can't remember any of the names on there, but I'm sure they were all gone before uh, 2000, uh, one, 19, 1900. 1900, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And oh, uh, then Bob, uh, I bailed hay for Bob and uh, got his brother, Jim was, uh, we gave him a job, he came out from Sioux Falls and I assumed everyone could run the tractor and things, so he was on the tractor, uh, oh, running the baler and uh, and then you usually turn inward when you turn, and he turned outward, and the baler came way out and, and uh, bailed three, four new fence posts <laughs> and tore up my baler. But uh, uh, many years later, in Sioux Falls, uh, Uncle Bob, uh, or Bob, my brother in law Bob, was at the golf course, and he went up to my other brother-in-law, Jim Enneman, and he said, hey, do you remember me? And he said, no, no, who are you? And he said, well, you're the, I'm the guy whose post hole posts you bailed long ago. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another good photo of the Nearson family. Um, uh, and this must have been that 1962. This is 1962 at Elmer's Farm. At Elmer's Farm, again, the girls. Uh, with their mom and dad and then this is a later photo with of course the girls grown I'm not sure um, but actually you yeah, know this it maybe is Beverly and uh, Bob's anniversary or something it looks it, like a it special could be the 25th get, anniversary. Uh, get a special get-together that they're all dressed up for um, and it's Roberta and Susan and Valerie and Bev and Bob. This one, I wonder if, since they've all got uh, corsages, whether it's like a wedding or, um, yeah. but I don't know. Again, picture of the girls um, with uh, dressed up Val and Susie and Bobby. And then. And by the way, uh, about, uh, the, I think. Susan became a school teacher. Uh, Valerie was a nurse, and Bobby uh, was a, a student, a foreign student, uh, in charge of foreign students at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and would take them on trips overseas and uh, acclimate them to the U.S. Yeah. And this is a good picture of the um, of the expanded family, uh, including the brother, uh, you know, brother-in-laws, and uh, right. so with the Nearson family, um, and even some of the grandchildren. So that's a special photo uh, of the Nearson right. uh, family. Yeah, Valerie is still you know, works for an insurance company in nursing, right. using her nursing skills. And Susan married uh, Kevin and, and she always had wanted to live on a farm and raised a wonderful family right. and, uh, and uh, uh, did so well right. uh, with them. And then Roberta with her, right. all of her talents and no, international and, and students. Val Valerie, I... Uh, had twins and, and uh, she lost a, a child of, she was 24, 25 years old, but uh, there's quite a few people in our uh, family chain that has lost children and uh, 
one of them was uh, Art and Carol, and they uh, joined Compassionate Friends, which is a uh, organization to help the grieving process for people who lost children. Well, and Valerie lost Chad. Yes. Um, right. um, yeah, and um, yeah, just and, uh, tragedy. He had always said that no one. He said, "I don't have many friends," but his was one of the biggest funerals ever in Northern Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. It's a gentle spirit, uh, yeah. for sure. So. Um, any other Bobby and or stories about Bob and and Bev um, that um, you think of, Dad? I... Well, uh, Susan uh, had uh, took care of a children's home down in Iowa, run by the the Dutch uh, Christian Church. And she was shoveling the snow, everything with the kids. And they were special needs kids. And she would take them up to Minnesota to the farm. And they just loved Bob and hated to leave. They loved everyone there. But Bob would probably let them ride the horse and this and that. Or ride in the tractor. And uh, she, she was just... Uh, uh, and she, she lived in the house and took care of how many how children, many children I don't know. and probably was barely paid. Yeah, yeah, but she yeah. had a big, yeah. big, big heart. That's right. for sure. Right, got that yeah. gracious heart. Yeah. So we were going to switch to Uncle Ray, Rye, and and uh, we have his wedding picture with his wife Sandy. Sandy, and uh, so. Uh, Ray came after Bev. Bev. And uh, Raymond uh, had yellow yonders when he was born. And uh, the Lutheran Church felt that if a child dies without being baptized, you certainly to go to hell. So the first guy that came out was a minister, and he was baptized. And then a student nurse came out. And uh, they thought that was it. So he survived. And then he had uh, who the guy who, who's that guy that uh, met, did the Muffets and all that? Oh, Jim Henson. Henson. And he, then in his later years, he had that Henson deal with no one. Uh, the same disease that Jim survived. Henson had. And it's he named after Oh really? I, I didn't. So. I didn't know that. What, do you have a name for it? No, I don't. Okay. Um, but anyhow, he survived that. So he was back visiting. Maybe uh, he's been gone now about five, six years. But uh, he was back uh, visiting in his hometown, and the Nelson family, uh, Opal Elmer's Dwayne, uh, married. Uh, some uh, family, Marilyn, um, and, and, um, and her family, but it was like a relative of Marilyn's. Yeah, uh, a relative, nurse, yeah, or? Sather, so, of okay. her father, Sather. Sather. So, uh, my one cousin was over to the other cousin. My one nephew was over to the other nephew's house. My brother was over to my nephew's house. And this lady said, which one of the rise are you? And he said, well, I'm, I'm, Ran, I'm, I'm Raymond. And she says, I thought you died. She, she was, was a student nurse that was there for 40 years earlier. Yeah. And he, and he survived. It was a miracle. Just three, all the, three, he had, had different health issues. And he had three. Pacemakers. Uh, re pacemakers replaced, and he got a picture of the Minneapolis paper, and someone called me from Minnesota and said, do you know this guy? And, yeah, I said, yeah, it's my brother. <laughs> it's my brother. Yeah, no, so, he was a survivor, that's for yeah. sure. And he and I used to, uh, we had a flat-top buggy, 
there was a big workhorse on it, and we'd go in and out the ditches, and I was driving, and he, he, he broke his leg, and, and, and I was the driver of the... From falling off the buggy? Yeah, or the oh. buggy, we tipped over something. <laughs> and then when he was really small, uh, there's a famous maker of cream separators, which calls a de Lavelle. And when you put the bowl in that separates this cream from the milk, it takes you a long time to get up to 60 runs, and then the little bell stops ringing, and then you can turn the milk on and the cream will be separated. Well, but it's a big crank device yeah. with a big open gear. And then there was, up there there was open gears and we had that open and he thought he saw a mouse in there and he stuck his finger in and he lost his finger just below the uh, fingernail. So, and then we had the high tech, uh, uh, I don't know who, who was a Hoover Care or anyhow. So my parents stuck his finger in kerosene, and that took care of that. That was so, on the farm a lot of dangerous, um, dangerous things, yeah. you know. But and and when I was teaching at the Navajo Reservation at Canyon du Chez, he came to visit me, and uh, and he's very modest, very. Quiet, and uh, I said, I have to go over to see my neighbor. The neighbor was an American Indian Cheyenne tribe. And uh, he said, oh, I, I, I'll just be in the way. I said, come on. He came over there, and his neighbor had spent, my Indian friend had spent a lot of time in Alaska, and my brother Ray was in the Army in Alaska. So here... That was one time I was the only one that didn't get the talk. They they visited and visited oh, about Alaska. They had so I much forgot about, about that. That um, was yeah, wonderful. His service. Uh, so and here's a photo of uh, Ray with uh, uh, two of the kids. I'm not quite sure then. It would be Barbara and uh, Barbara and Raymond, probably. Yeah. And Ray. Okay. I think so. They're the oldest. Okay. And uh, here's another good family photo of Ray and and the family with uh, with uh, They're his mother with my mother Grandma and, Rye and Emma Thompson Rye so Ray and and Barb and uh, Jeff Jeff and uh, okay and uh, and Deborah yeah Wait, I think probably one did miss one uh, yeah, Steve, I think, would, would Steve. Steve be the yeah. youngest one? So here's here's another cute photo of the family. Um, um, with the kids growing up, and then here's one as the kids are all grown up. It's, it's hard to identify all of them. It must be... Um, because some of them look the same, but this had to have been Ray and Sandy's anniversary, right. like an anniversary party. Right. But I think it's Jeff. So, well, we're ready to move to the last of your siblings, uh, uh, Vivian, and uh, we've got a sweet photo, probably seen this one before, but Vivian's the baby or the toddler in the middle. This would be Beverly and this would be Raymond as, as children. Um, as a child, Vivian uh, seemed very cute and, and said lots of fun things Dad, that you remember when, when you still sort of tease her about. Well, uh, um, Elmer Nelson was courting my older sister, Opal, and he came to the farm and he always had a suit on with pockets on the side and he'd put a little candy in there. And as soon as he came in the door, she would reach in his pocket and get a couple pieces of candy. So she always waited for Elmer to come. 
And then uh, we moved to the other farm, and she's four or five years old, and we just had a cook stove, and in back was a big shed that just had cobs, corn cobs in there. And mother said, go out and get a pail of cobs for me to start the fire and the kitchen stove. And she said, I have to do all the work around here. So we <laughs> never let her forget that. How old was she probably so when she's... Maybe four or five. Oh, wow. And then in 1962, when we came from California and Don had brought the Mexican food and we had a birthday for... Fourth of July for Linda, uh, Helgeson, and Dale Rye, and Vivian was wearing long, floppy clown shoes. And Dan said she was his favorite aunt because she's always funny, you know. She always, yeah. Her and Donnie were always have always were always just a hoot, you know. Yeah. Uh, they were big plastic feet, I think. Yeah. Like getting that flip flop yeah. around. Uh, so Vivian and Don, uh, here's, here's a wonderful photo from Vivian and Don's wedding. And, Dad, you were one of the groomsmen, it looks like. Um, I guess so, yeah. And uh, uh, so do you remember and Dwayne was one of the Dwaynes in there as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the Helgesons were always... Uh, yeah, and there was uh, Donnie's mother... Uh, it's a Conley. Conley. And uh, <clears throat> they had an old liquor store in Hills in the hometown. And uh, one night he took come in the back door on a horse. <laughs> <laughs> and he rode the horse through the bar. And it's funny the horse didn't go through the floor. But uh, that was one of the fun, fun things. Uh, Alcus has always had a lot of fun and were big in some surprises. <laughs> yeah, they they were a uh, fun bunch, that's for sure. So, and Vivian and Don were always fun. And their oh. farm, since they lived on Grandma Rye's farm, yeah. was often a place where we would have uh, get-togethers right. and, and such. Uh, uh, on that score, there's a photo, an aerial photo, of uh, Grandma Rye's farm that's right. in in the and in the Nor photos. Norris lived on it first, and they probably uh, had the picture taken. But then Vivian and Don lived on the farm, and um, so for us kids, that was a place where we spent a lot of time growing up and playing with cousins. Would be at Donnie and Viv's. Uh, there were you probably spooked the cattle there, didn't you? Yeah, I think we we had was that it. Was that that was at Donnie's farm? Yeah, yeah the one time. The, so Viv and Don had um, daughters, Jewel and Linda and Emily, um, and then Jennifer and uh, Lynn. I, I guess that's uh, the four girls. Um, and and uh, they left the farm and they bought a resort and. All the girls, they had five uh, almost teenage girls, and so they did so well on the resort, they had all of their own hell. Yeah, um, here's, so here's the 1962. one photo. That was the, at the family reunion at in 62. Like and then Elmer's. Elmer's. This was Grandma Rice, uh, the farmhouse. That's Again, the farm we spent house, so much right. time there. Yeah. This one... I wonder if this is when they had already moved up to the lake. Uh, they've got one of the Bach children with them. Yeah, they always stayed up there. Yeah, the Bach were yeah. with them, but it was in Black Duck, Minnesota, and had a bunch of cabins and a lake, and he cleaned all the fish for the guests. Well, and Donnie always loved to fish, so yeah. he. Um, yeah, the lake. Um, he, I think, the first time I ever went fishing was with Uncle Donnie, and I think. Randy and Angie and I maybe went, or Randy and I went with him, and he took us fishing. And I remember, I think Randy cast it back and caught me with a hook or something. But Donnie w always could smooth things out right. and sort of make it fun. This is a, a good photo of 
Donnie and Viv and the girls at the uh, resort. At the resort, I would guess this was probably a wedding, or maybe it was their anniversary, um, because oh, uh, there's. Yeah. It's probably an anniversary, their anniversary maybe, uh, but a uh, great photo of, of uh, Jewel and Dan and Teresa and uh, Jennifer, Linda, M, and this must be M's husband. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, Donnie loved to fish and they always had fun. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And the girls can tell such hilarious stories of growing up. And Donnie, uh, they have a curling team in Bemidji that's famous worldwide. And Donnie and Viv used to cook hamburgers for them. When, but anyhow, they, uh, and he also raised money through the Legion for nurses. And so uh, scholarships for nurses. So here is little Dan, uh, Dan and Jules, no, Teresa, and that's their granddaughter who got one of the scholarships and is a nurse in Minneapolis. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's neat. That's, that's neat. Here's just a nice picture of Donnie at the lake in Black Duck and a nice photo of Donnie uh, at Jules' wedding, uh, once once the once they moved up to the lake, I, us we kids did, never we got, we never got up anymore. to the lake, which was which was sad. Would have loved that. But we better have one more of Johnny. So yeah, give the, okay. Uh, yeah, he doesn't look like the guy who would get in trouble, but he was two years behind me in high school, and we there was a place. A first service station across the highway, and uh, we were over there playing cards, and uh, everyone say, "Here comes the principal," and then oh, and then he finally did come, and the guy wasn't much of a housekeeper, but there was five of us. Some crawled under the bed in the back, and one guy had a, a cleaner's deal in front of him, and. He's the only one who didn't get caught, and they took us back to the school. And then uh, the thing is that it was my fault because uh, my brother Norris had come to get me to help on the farm, and, and uh, they said, "Well, Glenn already gave us a note, and he's all helping in." <laughs> so, so Don and I weren't really like that, and you would laugh about George it. Nelson. Uh, never got caught. Okay, I, I think he led me astray, but that that would be lying. Yeah, the other fun Don and Viv stories, to just or that you think of, Dad, or just well, they she, were always. She worked in the grocery store when they lived in Hills and Farm with another cousin of ours. Uh huh. Uh, and Viv did. Jennifer, you know, our, or, the guys we got together with. Uh, right. Uh, here that lived here. Yeah. Uh, forget the Blyes. Uh, the Blyes. Blyes. Yeah. So, but, but uh, they were always fun. Yeah, always a lot of fun. So, but the, the daughters are also quiet and soft spoken, except for one, Jennifer, and. Uh, you can take that for what it's worth, the uh, Ellison girls. Yeah, it's such a fun group. Uh, well, we're sort of coming towards the end, but uh, the 1962 photos were a family get-together at Elmer's, <laughs> and we have some different pictures. This was from 1962, just yes. a photo of all the Families. cousins together with Grandma Rye. Uh, so those are just... Her, that would be her grandchildren. Right. And then this is a photo of Grandma Rye's actually in it, but it's cut off. It's a color photo. I don't know if it's from the same time period. It, it actually may be. It's just a color photo, whereas this one's a nice black and white 
photo. Um, these are just some fun old photos of different groups of cousins, probably taken with one of our cameras. Here's a here's a sweet photo of of their At our, Norris's farm. Us kids with Nori's kids. And that's another one. It uh, looks like uh, it's this be is at Vivian's. Vivian's. At Beverly's place. Beverly's house. Is it? Is it Aunt Beth, Beth's and yeah. Bob's? Okay. Oh, oh. So here's a fun one of again a bunch of the cousins uh, in front of uh, Bev and Bob's Beverly's, uh, the farm. place. Uh, again, uh, we came from a period where. Uh, I forgot what the count was on the number of cousins from the reunion, but yeah. ninety-two, ninety-two relatives at the reunion. Okay. Not that many cousins, no. but huge number of cousins that we grew up with. Whereas today, of course, you know, like uh, most kids, maybe have a handful of cousins or maybe a dozen at the most uh, would be large. We probably had well, we had scores of cousins, and we were. Obviously, around the same age, and we certainly had a wonderful time together right. in in uh, growing up, going back to Minnesota. Right. Lots of times, the Fourth of July, getting to do fireworks and stuff. Lots of things that we got to do as California kids that right. was so different than what what we were exposed to growing up in California. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, between the we're, fireworks we're, we're and the blessed, farm animals, that's for sure. There are lots of wonderful times together, and you and Mom made it possible by, uh, you know, taking us each year to see the family, and that's why we're so close with them. Uh, you know, lots of families well, we, that we, far we, apart would never have known each other. We felt our duty to go back to see our mothers too, and that's that's true. Yeah. yeah In know. fact. Uh, my mother would stay on the farm with the Helgesons, and then she felt the first year, she felt 1962, and she felt badly because she wasn't in the deal. But then, when all the kids were around, it was too much for her. So, we bought the camper trailer and put it in her drive and house in town. And the, all the cousins came, they were in the camper. And it was quiet in the house, so she had the best of both worlds. Yeah, yeah. We had lots of fun times right. and uh, the memories of uh, uh, parades down the street right yeah. in front of Grandma Rye's yeah. house uh, with all of the cousins and Roger and uh, Riding you know, his horse. Roger or Dwayne on the horse or, you know, very special times. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, uh, in Minnesota they have a hundred year farms and they dedicate them uh, by the state, they designate them. And uh, Susan Nearson married Kevin Olson, and theirs was a hundred year farm. This is a hundred year family. My father and mother, Gulick Rye and Emma Thompson. Their marriage in 1916. Okay, fast forward 98 years in 19 uh, or 2014, 13? Yeah, uh, 14. 2014, and uh, Mar all of the sisters, and then Marilyn Nelson, and uh, Mary Nelson and her daughter, uh, and and Dan, Dan and Marie and Marie uh, Larock, they also drew up a hundred-year photo album, and uh, now these are the families uh, at this reunion, and the first one then would be. I don't know that you'll be able to identify all of them. Yeah. But well, this this is the family of all of them. This is all of us. Everyone that came to the reunions. There was ninety-two people. Ninety-two. Left. Yeah. And then here's here's all the cousins. Uh, so it would have been Grandma Rice and. Uh, this is the family of Norse and Lorraine Rye. 
that opal. No, this is all of the cousins. Dad. Oh, okay. So this is all of the cousins that be Grandma Rai's grandkids right. and and your father's right. uh, grandchildren. So these are the first cousins. This one included all of the uh, different families and husbands and wives and and uh, grandkids and great grandkids. So that's the larger yeah. group. Yeah. And then this one would be sort of going in order. This one is Opal and Elmer's. Opal, Opal and Elmer's family. Uh, from their reunion, a wonderful picture of their family. And then next in line would be Norris. uh, Norris's family. So Norris and Lorraine. Norris and Lorraine's family. And then next would be Eldora and uh, Orville's Eldora family. Eldora and Orville Bach and their fa family and descendants. Yeah. So, and then the representatives with Dad, it was just Randy and I, uh, Mona, Karen, and, and Gregory uh, weren't able to come. Right. But, uh, so there's, there we are for, for Dad's family. And then this is uh, Beverly and Bob's family right. from their reunion. So Val and Roberta and uh, Valerie's daughter, Chirsty, and her husband, Ryan, and, and their son, uh, Cole, So and, and Bobby's husband, Ed, the dear, dear friends and relatives. Then we have Uncle Raymond and Aunt Sandy's family right. from their reunion. Again, wonderful photo. Uh, at, at Dan and Marie's farm. And then last but not least was uh, the shy and reserved Helgeson girls. And hilarious <laughs> Helgeson. <laughs> so, uh, Please forgive us. We love you. Yeah. So that I hope that this video, I know it's run long um, and our, uh, we've rambled on here and there, but hopefully it'll give you all a good um, taste of the rye, yeah, not family. the whiskey. Well, lots of uh, dad's stories and things that we all remember and so fondly. Uh, and so, dad, I appreciate you doing the the film. Uh, I think all of us. the relatives have to thank uh, uh, dad for bringing these fine people. To you turn the camera on yourself so we can see who did this. I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. All right. <laughs> very patient. You know, give us. Got to give, give you the five. Okay. Uh, All right. We got to give you the five. Right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.